Okay, I call the meeting to order the Waitley Select Board on July 29th, 2020. Our first order of business is meeting minutes from uh, July 15th, 2020. Any discussion? I would uh, move that we um, approve the minutes from the previous meeting. Thank you. Okay, a second. Yeah. Okay, roll call vote. Joyce? Yes. Jonathan? Yep. Fred? Yes. Okay, vendor and payroll warrants. They're in the packet information. Mm -hmm. Any comments? No comments from me. No. Okay. Moving on. Uh, public comment. <laughs> was an email from Mary Stewart on Chestnut Plain Road, speed and Jake break noise. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk about this all at once when we talk about the speed study or do you want me to read it now? I, I guess I would like to wait till we talk about the speed study. Is that okay with anybody else? Fine by me. And I don't see, uh, I don't know if Mary or anybody else from Chestnut Plain Road is going to be on. I'm not sure. Heard? Okay. I have not. Okay, we'll leave that till later on the agenda. Okay. So we're a few minutes early for our, our first scheduled appointment. Uh, Torre Verde, uh, David uh, Alleman. Uleman to discuss and consider an amendment and restated host community agreement for the proposed marijuana retail establishment to be located at 424 State Road, Whaley. Okay, Mr. Ullman or, okay. Yes, can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, thank you so much for having us. Uh, my name is David Ulian. I'm an attorney at uh, Sorry. Vicente Cedarburg. That's okay. Uh, at Vicente Cedarburg, and I'm here on behalf of uh, Torre Verde, Massachusetts 3, Inc., um, which is seeking to locate a marijuana retail establishment in Waitley. And we're seeking approval of an amended host community agreement. Uh, that's simply um, kind of, it's a, it's a new agreement because uh, we felt it was necessary because the uh, prior agreement stated that the agreement would lapse if Torre Verde did not receive a final license from the commission within 18 months of the effective date of the initial host community agreement. So, you know, it has been 18 months and although we've received a provisional license uh, in June, uh, we have not yet received a final license uh, from the commission, even though we're, we're working our way through that. And, you know, due to the, uh, the coronavirus pandemic and uh, delays associated with the commission's um, license application review and approval process, uh, we have not yet received a final license. So uh, we're simply asking for uh, the same agreement to be re-signed so that uh, it continues to be maintained in, in good standing. And uh, that, that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, I provided a, an agreement to, to the town administrator showing our proposed changes. Um, and as well as a, an estimated timeline of when, you know, we hope to commence operations. Um, but other than that, I'm, I'm here to answer any questions that the select board might have. And I'd also mention, I'm, I'm also joined here by um, Billy Beats, who is the president and chief executive officer of, of Torre Verde. He, he's available to answer questions as well. Okay. Brian, did you have you or I guess Joyce reviewed the agreement and it's pretty similar to what we we signed uh, previously. I looked at it, yeah. The, the and they provided a version that, that had track changes and the changes are in the are in the introductory whereas clauses to explain the reasons for the the amended and restated agreement. Okay. Yeah, there's an extra whereas that's kind of the bulk of the changes. Um, I don't think there were any, ch there's no changes to any of the meaningful parts Substance. of the agreement. So I would move that we, um, uh, I guess, sign this agreement or agree to the agreement 
um, yep. given it's what we agreed to earlier and there's um, no, I don't see any reason to, to amend it now. We just did the, uh, the very exact same thing with another grower just uh, a week or two back. So I, I don't see any reason to, to treat this any differently that. than any other. So. These guys have, have demonstrated remarkable staying power considering how long it's taken the state to, to act actually. Joyce, you made a motion to approve? I made a motion, yeah. And I seconded it, Fred. Okay, yeah, I just comment. I saw your timeline, which you put together. I thought that was that was very detailed and explained better the process. I guess I appreciate that, doing that. And I didn't realize it would take until, what, next March or April, you're talking for, you can actually open for business. So it is... Uh, quite lengthy uh, time period and a lot of steps involved. So thanks for sharing that with us. Sure, happy to. Thank you. Okay, roll call vote. Joyce? Yes. Jonathan? Yep. Fred, yes. Okay, thank you very much. All right, thank you, thank you. appreciate it. Okay, moving on the agenda. We're actually going through this early, okay. Uh, Lynn, Lynn is on next for uh, talk about the town elections, various locations, hours, election workers, and connecting to uh, uh, also an item on a robocall service agreement. Right. Um, the September 1st and November 3rd elections, we have to decide where we want to have them. Um, I kind of messed up a little bit on a time frame. Uh, in order to move an election, we actually would have to do a survey of the, the site to which we are going to move the election to, have it posted on our website for three days before the select board actually votes on it. Um, the complicating issue is this all has to be done 20 days prior to the election. You folks meet on August 12th and 20 days prior to the election is August 11th. So um, my, I was hoping that maybe you'd consider using the old town hall as an election site. Um, the school, um, even though in September they won't I don't believe they'll be in session because their um, opening date has is likely um, moved forward a bit. Um, it may be better to just make a decision for both elections at this point in time. And the Old Town Hall, Hall I feel, is probably the best option, mainly because you can bring people in one, the front door or the back door, whichever way we want to go and then they can go out the other door so you wouldn't have people crossing paths um and that was the good thing about using the elementary school for the town election um the town office building where we've had elections uh is just kind of difficult to keep people from interacting they would go in the same door that they would have to go out the side door doesn't really have a sidewalk attached to it. There's a little landing outside the door, but there's no sidewalk. So anyone <clears throat> who has any type of um, disability would have a difficult time exiting out that side door. Uh, so um, I would like to suggest that we use the old town hall. Now I know the old town hall is closed presently. Um, so I'd be looking for an exception. Um, I have to do the survey. I've started it, but I haven't completed the handicapped accessible survey, which needs to be posted on the website and before you, you folks vote. So I did email Brian earlier about our options. I mean, one option is to keep the school for the September election and then change the November election. Um, that seems that's a possibility, but it could be confusing to the voters. Um, the other option is uh, um, if I could have you have a quickie selectman's meeting, perhaps next week for maybe five minutes just to take a vote on changing the location to the Old Town Hall. Um, 
so I guess that's quite a bit of information in a short time period. And uh, okay. at the town, if we use the town hall, then would that it would be on a second floor? Yes. And, and then I'd have enough room for social distancing and there's the elevator for those people who would need that resource. Um, so people would say, say if they came in the back door, go yep. up those back staircase, come into the back, do their business, then uh, unless you needed the elevator, right? If you right. don't need you the elevator- You would exit out the front. You exit out the front those using the elevator there's a so there's a minimum amount of backtracking to the elevator when they get to the bottom they can exit out the front as correct. well correct okay i might actually think about doing it the other way that people would come except for those handicapped folks who would have to use the handicapped entrance using yeah. the front staircase mm -hmm. and go out the back i think that one may cause less interaction mm -hmm. oh okay so um, so would would the uh, first floor be closed really to everybody, including the restrooms being closed as well? Well, the restrooms would have to be open because my election workers would need to be able to use them. They're well, there for 13 hours. I don't think their bladders will hold that long. But, but we could close the restrooms to the general public. General public. Um, I'd have to check on that. And really, if you're going to do that, you might as well close the rest of the first floor, I guess, the hallway and the other room and whatever, kitchen and whatever. Yeah, I think you could manage could do that. to close off most of it. I don't know. Um, I'll have to check the restrooms because I don't know if that's a requirement. Uh, let's see if it's a requirement in my survey. Um, uh, it does seem like if we can have the restrooms open for anybody who needs it, that that would I would actually think that'd be the preferred way to do it. I mean, we're gonna have to go in and do cleaning before and after or at intervals, no matter what. Right, um, and so. you're gonna have yeah because you're gonna have election workers who will have to use the bathrooms. Right. Um. So they're gonna be need need to be cleaned anyways. Yeah. Um. What what hours are, are we looking at for both? We have to, I have to be open 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. You know, personally, I think that we we should be consistent between the two elections. I have no problem meeting quickly. Brian, emphasis on the word quickly, next week um, to do this. But I, I think that Lynn's idea is is is, is very practical. <clears throat> Okay, I guess I kind of agree with with Jonathan. Yeah, I should keep both locations, and I don't have any problem meeting next week. Yeah, same here. Okay, I will get the survey done tomorrow um, so that we can post it on the website for three days, and then we'll be able to schedule whatever's convenient for you folks next week. So do we have meeting. to take an action, Brian, to change this? Location. Um, I just have a quick question, and Fred, you may know the answer to this. Um, in terms of ventilation, can those windows open? Um, yes, they can. Now Even with this, there's screens somewhere. Yeah, in a closet somewhere. So there is. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, both floors. I, I think all the windows can open. Okay. Although they have, don't they have that plastic? Um, yeah. Like window windserts or yeah. No, you, there's a plexiglass partition or, or piece of plexiglass on, on the bottom half of the of the of the windows that you'd have to remove with like toggle oh, switches, okay. and you remove that, and then you insert a screen, a separate screen. That's what you'd have to do with okay. all the windows there if you wanted to. The screens for a fresh air to come in. Okay, because those mini but those mini splits don't bring in fresh air, right? Right. It just recirculates what's in there. Right. <clears throat> okay. I I'm for the the September primary. Let me let me clarify. 
I've already received 200 requests for early vote ballots for both elections. Yeah. My guess is as far as how many will actually be appearing to vote in public, considering I also have to have early voting hours, which is our next topic of discussion on how we're going to work that. Um, okay. I, I think we'll have many fewer people actually voting in person than we've had in the past. So... For the town elections, um, I know you told us this before, but how many people came on election day? I think it was 30. 30. Right. You'll Somewhere see in the 30, 32, something like that. Yeah, totally about like 300. Well, generally for the um, September primary, our turnout is relatively low. I think I actually have more requests for ballots already for the September 1st primary than I had actual voters. <laughs> there's a, but there's a, big, there's a big primary in this one. The yeah, there is a race on this one, so it may bring out more people, so. Okay. <coughs> I, I heard somewhere, and I don't know whether it was applying for, for uh, money for the COVID-19 uh, accommodations that there is a, an air purifier system that you can purchase that either goes on your existing, say, heating air conditioning system that's supposed to circulate, clean the air, and what, deionize it or something? I don't know if there's something like that available for, for the room or, or if you're doing it at the second oh. floor town hall to put something like that in a room that would help move the air around. Because there's no, there's no, Turn that ceiling. There's no fans, right, Brian? Is there fans on the ceiling? I think there's a fan. There's no fans. No, so, I don't yeah. think so. So there's no there's no air movement. Whether something like that would would help. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where I work, um, we have a similar problem with our a building. We don't have very much control over how much um, new air comes in with the ventilation. So being concerned about that, we bought some room air purifiers. Um, and uh, depending on the, I mean, one unit was big enough for even our largest classroom, but um, I think one unit might not be enough for that room, but it's certainly something we could look into. It was only a few hundred dollars. It was something um, we did a bit of research with Consumer Reports. Um, the filters you're talking about are HEPA filters. The HEPA filters will filter down to 0.1 microns, which would catch many, but not all. Uh, virus particles. Virus particles can go down to like 0 0.7, 0 0.07 microns, but m they range. They have a range between like 0 0.07 and 1 point something. So they, um, it does catch a lot of them. So in, we bought them for the rooms where we were uncertain how much fresh air was coming in so that we could use them as classrooms in the fall. So I've got some of the research done on that already. And um, I can, uh, I can, go back and look and see how many square feet um, or cubic feet that can filter and you could, and it's really quiet. I love these little guys because they're really quiet. And are they that get used with, with windows closed or open or? Yes, you... with the windows closed, it's just uh, taking the air that's in the room, cycles it through and purifies it. It's got an ionizer in it, like you mentioned. You can turn the ionizer on or not. Uh, and it's got three speeds. Um, it's got a HEPA filter. The HEPA filter is about, uh, I don't know, 12 by 18 or 12 by 24, something like that. Um, and that's, um, that's something we, we could consider. It sounds like, I mean, and then it can be used for other purposes as well, not just yeah. on election day, so. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so will you look into that, Lynn? And yeah, yeah I'll, I'll see. I'll look up the uh, the information and send what our purchasing information to Lynn and um, okay, and that would be a good way to follow up. So you don't have to do a lot of research <laughs> on it. Okay, okay, great, thank you. Okay, sure. so getting back, Brian. Do we need to make a, a decision on on the date on the location of the election? Uh -huh. What I'd be looking for is just to um, make sure I'm headed on the right path, that the old town hall is the best option. And if you 
could approve of that part um, tentatively pending the evaluation, which should be fine given that it, it was be. recently handicapped, you know, approved for that purpose. Right. So um, I'm not anticipating any problems with the survey. Um, but the official vote will have to come after that three day voting, uh, three day period once it's posted on the website. So should we set a date now for the meet next meeting? Sure. I mean, since the gang's all here. Yeah. Um, so if I get the, um, thing post, um, completed and posted tomorrow um then one i guess any day next week would and they didn't say it had to be business days it was just three days so oh well, yeah but let's err on the side of caution on that one I think. okay um i mean we usually meet on wednesdays at six would that work it works for me the fifth be a really short meeting yeah, I can't anticipate that it would be more than, at least on this topic, would be more than five minutes because we've already discussed it, so. Well, is this is a Zoom meeting or is this we have to go sign? Um, it's a Zoom meeting. Zoom, yeah. Oh, okay. So It's just a vote you have to take. I guess I'd prefer to do it at five as opposed to six, personally. Okay. Although if it's going to be quick, I don't care. Okay, so what day are we, we decided on? Wednesday the 5th? 5th. Did it work for you, Brian? Yep. Okay, the, the 5th at 5? Sure, 5 is fine with me. August 5th at 5, okay. Sounds yeah. good. Okay, that's great. Thank you for accommodating me. I I messed oh. up. I read it that it after the vote, it had to be posted within three days. But no, it was before the vote, it had to be posted in three days. So... Um, the other thing is early voting. Um, I haven't gotten any further direction on early voting. Um, early voting is supposed to be held during your normal business hours. And given, I'm not sure what is considered normal business hours, um, but I still would like to have early voting at the town offices. It's just, it's much more convenient. Um, mm -hmm but it would require the use of one of the conference rooms, whether it's the big one or the little one. I've always used the little one off to the side, um, but because Brian and Amy are down there, it may make more sense to use the bigger conference room to keep them from going down that hallway where Brian and Amy are. Lynn, um, Lynn I think you want to use the big one anyway, because that and I can distance people. Yeah, I can distance people more in that one. Um, it's, Lynn, is, is it possible to use that, the open meeting room behind you, behind you and uh, your area? You've got the hallway and you've got a big open room and you've got an exit. you got an exit door at the other end? No, there's no exit door at oh, the other no end. There's no exit door? No. Oh, okay, so. No. Um, if early voting is anything like in the past, people straggle in. I don't normally have bunches of people waiting to vote. So I'm thinking that the cross crossing of people shouldn't be that, um, there shouldn't be a lot of that. And if there is, we'll monitor who goes into the room and who comes out and how that works. Um, the, my biggest question right now is the hours, and I won't have an answer to that until tomorrow. We have a Zoom meeting with all the cities and towns um, on elections tomorrow. Um, it is a question that I submitted uh, to have an answer to on whether it, our business, normal business hours are pre-COVID business hours or our bus business hours now. I, you know, it's not terribly clear. The legislation isn't very clear. So um, that's where we're at at this point in time, trying to determine how many hours. So many town halls are not open at all yet. They aren't open to the public at all. Um, some are only open by appointment. Um, so I, I, I can't imagine that they would use current business hours as 
uh, early voting hours. So that's still up for grabs, but as long as I have your okay to use the large conference room, seeing it's not used for meetings at this point in time, um, I can set things up and leave it there for the for the duration of early voting, which is um, a week for the September primary and two weeks for the November election. Should um, things change by November, I may have to look for a different option for the early voting. But at this point in time, it seems that the large conference room would be the best. So, okay, so you need some uh, acceptance. I just wanted to run that by you to make sure okay. that you are comfortable with that idea of using the large conference room. Sure, I have no problem with that. Okay, very good. And will you be on our August 5th meeting? Tell us what you- Yeah, I can, I can do that. You can join us here, what you hear, what you find out from your Zoom meeting. With, yeah, I the, can do oh, that too. Keep us yeah. up to date on that. Yeah, we will do. Okay. And I think the other two items are pretty standard. It's uh, voting the election workers um, for the coming year and also the um, Connect CTY contract, which is the same as we've had for the last several years. Dollar amount is, is I believe, the exact same amount. So. Okay. I think Brian may have submitted the list of election workers to you. Yes. Okay. And is there still the concern of the, uh, I guess, seniors on that list? Well, um, I've left everyone on the list um, just because I'm leaving it up to them to decide on whether they want to. I do have some seniors who, why are you leaving me off of this? Um, I think the precautions that we're taking with the screening and the, the masks and everything else that we have to do, I feel relatively comfortable that we're, we're safe. Um, and I think many of those election workers feel the same way. Several of them have already come to me and asked me, can I work on the election in September? Um, so... I think it's up to them. If they feel safe and they feel comfortable, then I will be more than happy to have them. Okay, so we don't need to, to exclude them on the list or identify them or doing anything. No, and this is a yearly appointment. So if things clear by next June when we have our town election, yeah. I can use those those people on that list as well. So I've got several more people who are interested in being election workers that are on that list now. So you had some young, young, younger people on there. Are they on there still? Yeah, I have a couple of younger folks. I have one that's not a registered voter yet. Um, she's 17, but I can have um, kids that are over 16 not registered to vote yet. They can work the polls. Um, mm. I can have two at each election. So okay. I only have one right now, but. Okay, well, that's good. Although we'll have to see what college and school, how that affects those, those election workers, but. Yeah. Okay. Anything else we need to talk about with Lynn? Um, I just want to um, highlight that I just received the calendar invite and it was invited for six and I thought we had agreed to five. Yeah, I've got five on my uh, calendar here. Yeah, so I don't know whether Amy just did that um, because she's organized, but it's, but if Amy's on, it's five o'clock, not six o'clock for the, for the invite. Okay, just a little different subject. I think you're maybe aware of it, Lynn, the, the census that's mm -hmm. going around, are you know how many have responded or are you you're I, involved in that at all? I checked the other day and we were at 70%. Okay. 
which is good considering um, many of the people in the center of town that have P.O. boxes still haven't been visited yet. So um, I, I, 70 percent isn't too bad. They're going to be, I believe, August 3rd or 6th, they're going to start knocking on doors uh, for those people that they haven't had responses from yet. The problem was that um, the people in the center of town who have P.O. boxes didn't get a mailing. Uh, so some of the people have taken it upon themselves to fill out the census online or whatever. Um, but that created another little issue because a lot of the addresses weren't recognized if you had put in um, South Deerfield or Waitley. It, it, it mattered how it was recorded at the Census Bureau. So some, like I filled mine out and I put my address of Waitley, Mass. Um, but I got a postcard the other day saying that they were still going to be visiting me because they couldn't recognize my address, I guess. So there's some situations like that where um, our address situation has created a problem. Right. Um, but I still thought 70% was, was pretty good considering our mailing issues. So and that goes, that goes till the what? End of the year? Is there... The end of August, um, is their main push and then they'll do follow-ups after that. So. Hey Lynn, how do people check? Cause I'm guessing there are going to be a lot of people who might see this or might see other, uh, reminders about the census, but then they might say, I don't know whether I did it or not. How do you check to make sure that you've done it? I think if, if you've got the code that was mailed to you, if you've got the, uh, if you got a mailing and the, you've got that code, if you try to go in again, they'll tell you it was already done. Right. But, let's assume but you if you don't, don't have, have that code, um, I don't know that there's a way. I just, I mean, if you re if you do it again, they'll they should recognize it as a duplicate somewhere along the line. Right. Okay. So. Well, or if you keep getting a mailing, uh, don't they keep sending it to after a couple of weeks go by if you haven't responded? They do to those people who have um, the correct mailing addresses, but those people who have P.O. boxes won't get a, another mailing. They get a little, you get a generic postcard. I think everyone got kind of a generic postcard that said, make sure you fill out your census. But as far as the specific one um, to your address, if it's a PO box, you, you don't get it. They're gonna be coming to your door, either hanging something on your door, or they will, if you don't answer the thing that you hung, they hung on the door, then they'll knock on your door later on in the, the month of August. Is this something they're going to tell, say, the, the town that they're coming to knock on your door, or is it just? Um, I think. Uh, how is the town? How's the chief going to know people going around knocking on doors? Yeah, I I can forward. I got a post, um, an email a while back from my contact at the census. I can I can send that on to Jim. I think they actually do. Um, I'm trying to think of what they did 10 years ago. They, they did they, contact us. I, yes, I was thinking yeah. that they did come in and say, we're going to be making our rounds. Yeah, they did do And that. they would give a description of their car and mm -hmm. a copy of their IDs. Yeah, we had we had them fill out our solicitor registration form. Even though okay. they're not soliciting, we that's the form we had them use yeah. last okay. time. Do you know if there's going to be any digital... Um, literature or anything that we could post to social media to let people know that they're going to be around? Uh, I, I've had I people in the past, I've had people in the past tell me that if somebody comes to their house, they're going to be greeted with a gun. <laughs> so, <laughs> we just want to make sure that people are aware that they're going to be out and about. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Let me see what I can find. Jim, I, I hope that you um, encourage that that not be the standard response when someone comes to their door. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> you'll you'll have the video camera to take a picture of them, right? So you'll know. Yeah. 
I know who they are. So if, if we have any missing uh, census workers, I'll know where to look. Yes. <laughs> Those census workers have a hard job. Yeah, I mean, they, they were supposed to start in, I think, the end of June doing the door-to-doors. And because of the COVID-19, they've postponed it and it got, I think it was going to be in mid-July and then it got moved to now the beginning of August. So. Okay. Anything else for Lynn? So Lynn, you need motions to appoint the election workers and a motion to approve the CTY agreement? Yes, probably. Okay. Then uh, I'll make a motion um, to approve the oh, list of right, options. No, Joyce, go ahead. I'm You'll second it. No, I, I... Okay, roll, roll call vote for approval of election workers list. Joyce? Yes. Jonathan? Yeah. Brad, yes. Okay. We have roll call vote for the uh, robocall service agreement. Joyce? Yes. Jonathan? Yeah. Brad, yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, thanks, Lynn. Good night, Lynn. Okay. Uh, moving on, we got the uh, FERCOG is Lori Scarborough is, was going to talk about the uh, speech studies. Oh, well, I see Lori just uh, joined us. Uh, before we. Yeah. Hi, Lori. Hi, Fred. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I couldn't be there on camera, but um, up here in Chesterfield, our internet is not that friendly to Zoom. Mm. Okay, okay. Uh, before we get into some more specifics about your, your speed study, uh, yeah. we had another comment from a citizen, a group of citizens in town about speed limits on, on one of the streets that you did your survey on, and they wrote a detailed letter to our <laughs> administrator uh, asking that it be read and their concerns uh, voiced again to the board and to the public. So, Brian, would you like to read that or, or show it on screen or? Um, I can do both. Or highlight what's, if you don't want to read word for word, highlight what's on the screen. Well, we actually got two letters. Uh, right from right. Mary, one from Mary Stewart and the other from uh, Donna Wiley. Yep. Let me share it. <clears throat> has, has everyone that's on Zoom today seen these letters? Well, I've seen it because it's in the packet, but I'm not right. sure anybody else has. Well, I don't know. Keith, have you seen them? Yes, I have. Okay. And the chief, Jim? I have not seen it. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so that's the, this is the first letter. Um, it says, back in May, a group of Chestnut Plain Road residents brought to your attention the number, noise, and speed of traffic in large trucks that run between Swamp Road and Haydenville Road. This information was shared at the select board meeting on May 29th, 2019. It is our understanding that a speed study was conducted and the results will be shared with the Board of Selectmen at the end of this month. Regardless of the findings of this study, we would like to submit the following observations from those who live on CPR. The stop sign at, Wait at Waitley Inn is ignored on a regular basis. The truck noise begins at 5 a.m. If your window is open, it will wake you up. It feels unsafe to ride a bike or walk on the road given the speed that cars and trucks are traveling. Clearly, this portion of CPR is being used as a corridor or shortcut. The goal is to slow traffic down. As you know, there are numerous ways for that to happen, and we realize the Conway School of Design for Streetscape is due to be implemented and includes crosswalks, sidewalk design, etc. Additional actions would be helpful, for example, add a stop sign at the end of Christian Lane, put, a, put up speed signs reminding drivers that this is a congested area, particularly on Haydenville Road, enhance monitoring by local police, the creation of a robust speed trap would likely deter this behavior quickly, 
add additional historic district signage onto Haydenville Road. We implore you to consider which options are most suited to implementation as to resolve this issue and support the Whateley residents who live here and have invested in this community. Thanks for all that you do on our behalf. Sincerely, Ann Barker, Melissa Caldwell, Elizabeth Conless, Dan Dennehy, Rebecca Jones, Regina Labello, Jen Miriam, Howard Nenner, Mary Lou Roop, Mary Stewart, Timothy Stewart, Pamela White. That was the letter from those residents. And then uh, the board also received a letter from um, Donna Wiley and um, Neil Abrams. Just wanted to make sure that they both signed it. Um, Fred, do you want me to read that one as well? Well, if it says the same stuff, just uh, paraphrase. Um, I mean, it, 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 it talks about speed and, and speeding along this side of the, uh, up along this part of the road. Um, it talks about the intersection by the center school um, in terms of how it's difficult to navigate. And then the Haydenville, uh, Haydenville Chestnut Plain intersection. Um, there's issues, or they say there's issues about people. I think I think the proper term is rolling stop. Um, that they don't necessarily stop there. Um, it concerns about some visibility with the the current setup at the Waitley Inn. Um, but those are those are the main issues of the letter. The, the current setup at the weight land for outside dining is is that I know they, they mentioned it here is that a problem right now I believe that I believe I think both Keith and Jim have checked it out it is there it are some Jersey barriers there that so it's probably less visible than it used to be um, less clear your view across the the parking lot okay. well the I, I spoke with Brian about this um, when the issue came up as far as the Jersey barriers go. And if you're actually stopped at the stop sign, um, like you're supposed to be, the Jersey barriers aren't causing any, any visibility issues. It's the, the people that want to glance across the parking lot and roll through the stop sign that are going to have the, um, the impeded visibility. So I've, I've been through there hundreds of times since it's been up and I have no issue. I haven't heard of anybody that's had an issue. We haven't had any close calls. We haven't had any crashes. Um, so I, I don't feel that there's any uh, real concern with the position of the Jersey barriers as they sit right now. Okay, Brian, could you go back to the to the first letter? And I, I guess I like to go through some of their specifics and I, I guess I could make some comments uh, on how we could address some of these and, and see what the rest of the people on today uh, feel about it. Uh, okay, first, okay, stop sign Waitley and ignored on a regular basis. Well, I, I guess my comment would be to make sure the sign is, is uh, what I would say, legally placed on, on the side of the road as far as height and distance and, and I guess the shape of the sign is, is fine. Uh, I guess Keith would know that. And I don't know, would it, would it help if you put a, you see adv advanced uh, stop ahead or advanced, sometimes these signs for advanced signal ahead. If we put an advanced sign in front of this, would that make a difference? No, Fred. Quite honestly, they they know they got to stop there. Right. Okay. You cut. You're you're coming to a a very obvious T intersection. Right. It should be extremely obvious that you need to stop there. Um, putting you know signage just starts to have sign pollution, and the more signs you put up, the less effective things become. And quite frankly, when you have your regulatory signs, meaning your stop signs, your yield signs, your speed limit signs, the signs that have some teeth to it, so to speak, that the police department, that you know that you can get a citation for, 
when they're not willing to observe those signs, putting up more that just say, hey, please slow down, they're not going to do that because they're not deterred by the fact of a speed limit sign looking at them. Okay. I mean, the one thing that I did talk to Jim about today that I feel will definitely help is when we put the crosswalks in, that we will put a speed limit sign up at the crosswalk so that as you come to the intersection of Haydenville Road and take a left and head north on Chestnut Plain Road, technically right now a person who has stopped could say they didn't know what the speed limit is. So once they take a left and head north on Chestnut Plain Road, we'll put up a, a speed limit sign on the crosswalk sign also so that they can't use that excuse and I'll make sure there's one in the proper location going south too. Can I make a suggestion please? Um, this is all great conversation, but I think it would help for context if we let Lori give us her report and then we can look at the suggestions and talk about others understanding what kind of traffic we're, we're looking at so we have all the information at our disposal before we take this up further well yeah the, i guess we could do that but uh some of these are, uh questions are asking uh our actions are asking we've known for a while and they may or may not be dependent on a speed study but they may but right but they may be you know we don't know until we do the yeah. speed study uh well okay uh i guess you could ask Lori to uh, yeah. talk about the speed study uh, i think we've all seen the uh the detail report you made uh and the changes you've made to it uh i don't know yeah. if, the, if uh, jim and keith have seen these yes, yes. as well yep. uh if you could just highlight, talk briefly about, about each location here. Sure, absolutely. Um, I might as well I'll start with um, Chestnut Plain Road, because um, that is, seems to be what's sort of most concerned to residents right now. Um, uh, the results that you're, you're seeing in the report, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Um, the, our traffic counters were located just uh, maybe a couple hundred feet, uh, pretty well in between. Um, the Christian Lane and Haydenville Road um, in that section um, and we found uh, that the 85th percentile speed um, which is the speed at or at or below which 85 percent of vehicles travel um, on that section where the speed will post the speed limit is 30 miles per hour um, the 85th percentile speed is 39 miles per hour um, and the pace speed the 10 mile um, the 10 MPH sort of uh, gap um, that most drivers are traveling within. So most drivers are traveling between 30 and 39 miles per hour. Um, the fastest speed we recorded was 68 miles per hour. I can say that, and the average speed was 34. Um, but when we're talking about traffic speed phase, we kind of look at the 85th percentile speed as, as sort of a, a rule of thumb for um, what most drivers feel is the safe speed for them to travel at um, and that's just a judgment that drivers make it doesn't always do often take into account the context of the road the pedestrians and bicycles and everything but um, no one's try usually trying to hurt themselves as they're driving so most people feel like they're cool going 39 miles per hour so um, any sort of treatments that could sort of give them a different message about what a safe speed is, is on that road would be helpful. Um, Can I make a quick comment? Sure, go ahead. Um, I noticed this says that the, the things were placed north of Haydenville Road. The complaints yeah. are all about south of Haydenville Road, uh, or at least that's the complaints I hear from people. And uh, I thought when we asked for these to be done, we asked for them to be done on the part of Chestnut Plain Road south of Haydenville Road. So I'm wondering um, who decided to put them where they got put. No, I, I think I think we left it up to the chief. It was we made the decision we were going to get specific mm. locations. It was up to the chief, and I don't know if Keith got involved in, in doing it. Because it's sort of like you know, Haydenville Road, and that person, that particular 
place. A lot of people will have just come to nearly a stop on Haydenville Road coming through there. So the fact that it shows that the speeds aren't that high necessarily isn't as relevant as if you hit it kind of before where the speed limit is 35, say just a little bit further out of town. That's where I think our complaints are for a lot of the speeding on that road. Um, those are the ones, certainly people who have personally emailed me were people who were uh, uh, substantially out, you know, south of Haydenville Road um, noticing cars just whipping through. And then when they get towards the center of town, there's things that, that you know, you've got visual cues to slow down. Um, so maybe that's why these results seem really reasonable. But I, I just wanted to point that out, that that's, um, if we do this again, assuming we will, that we should put those, the speed study south of Haydenville Road. Because okay. I think we'll get really different results on that same road. Right, okay. Uh, let's, Laurie, please move on. Um, sure, just to Joyce's point, um, I don't have it up on my computer right now, um, but we did do a count, I believe we did a count on um, that section of Haydenville, or Chestnut Plain Road uh, last year or the year before. I do have some speed data from that that I can look at. I'll say that I compared this um, northern section speed data to past year speed data, and it's uh, basically the same. The 85th percentile speed is about the same. The average speed is about the same as uh, pre-pandemic. So I could at least um, at, at, um, uh, get you the, the speed numbers from our previous count on that south of Haydenville Road section, um, and that will give us at least a good sense of what the vehicle speeds are on that section without doing a, a new count, um, which, we're, which we're happy to do. Uh, we can also do a new count later this season as well. But just saying that I honestly, in this and in other counts that we've done um, this summer, um, maybe it was different in April, but now in June, July, speeds that we're seeing not just in Waitley, but sort of around Franklin County are about the same as they were pre-pandemic. I know um, for a while when everyone, when there was nobody out on, everyone felt there was no one out on the road, there was sort of a spate of sort of reckless driving, but I, I'm getting the sense that that's calmed down a little bit, but still gotta, gotta watch out. Um, hey, Lori, were the number of vehicles pretty constant as well? Um, yeah, it was about 20% less than last year at this time today. Okay. Yeah. So. The, the other thing I noticed that the number of vehicles Look, looking at what you uh, identified as peak AM and peak PM, they're not really representative of, of normal traffic. You know, a morning yeah. peak hour at 11 o'clock in the morning is not what, what yeah. most uh, traffic engineers expect to see. There was no morning peak hour basically on, on some of these locations, so. Yeah, uh, that's, just, that's, yeah, you're right, Fred. That's one of the thing that is really different. Everyone's- right. No real predictable patterns, yeah. yeah we got to keep that in mind with, and at the time of year, the time you, you, you did this and and as volumes, as congestion or, or, or volumes are less, speeds increase. So if your, your volumes are down 20%, well, it's easier for people to go faster because there's less vehicles out there, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, please proceed with the sure, um, next one. Yeah, I think I'll just move on. If we have any more questions about Chestnut and Plain Road, we can come back to that. But um, if we want to move on to River Road, let me see that. Let me find okay. River Road for myself here. Okay, now River Road, I found this one interesting. I hadn't really looked at the speed data on this uh, road before. Um, and uh, yeah, with the posted speed limit there at 45 miles per hour, um, that's the 85th percentile speed. That's probably how that speed limit got set. Um, we did not really record any significant amount of speeding violations, especially when we look at that 10 mile per hour um, enforcement tolerance. The pace speed is between 36 and 45, so most people are going below 45. So. There's, I, I, there's not much, I was actually a little surprised um, at how little tech speeding was going on there, uh, to be honest with you. So um, I can answer questions about that or I can just hop over to Haydenville Road. 
We can move on to the next one, please. Yeah. But, do we happen you... to know? Um, do we happen to know? Because on River Road, the speed limit changes from 40 to 45 at different Yeah, this places. is in the 45 section. It was actually just right around um, uh, the uh, Hurley Fields uh, driveway. I okay. feel like um, I looked at the map, and it looks like it was actually probably between the field and the ice cream stand, the field, the driveway into the ball field and the ice cream okay. stand. I think it's just like right around there. Um, yeah, and I did double check after Brian corrected uh, corrected us. I think we had a typo in there. He had to speed at 40 when we did this originally, but checked uh, Google Street images, and it is definitely 45 in both directions there. Um, Lori, how did you obtain the, the speed data? What equipment did you use? I'm sorry? What equipment did you use to obtain the speed data to monitor speed? Oh, sure. Yeah, we use um, uh, automatic traffic recorders or ATR devices. Um, pneumatic, pneumatic tubes. Yeah, with the tubes. Yep, it's a, a set of two tubes uh, at a set distance uh, laid across the road at a set distance apart. Um, and the device operates with an air switch that's triggered as the vehicle tires the first tube and then the second tube right. um, and it uses the just the the time between between the switches of the first tube and the second tube to uh, calculate the speed of each vehicle um, it also um, uses the spacing between the next set of wheels to determine the size of the vehicle um, so the counts also tell us um, what's a car what's an extended pickup truck what's a tractor trailer um, that kind of thing. Um, I didn't uh, uh, pick that up in the letter about um, Chestnut Plain Road. Uh, the, some folks were com specifically concerned about speeding trucks. Um, that's not something that I analyzed in these uh, reports, which I, the, these speed studies, um, this includes all types of vehicles, but I am able with the data because of the way it, it's grouped up, I can get you uh, reports about which types of vehicles are doing what kinds of speeding. Um, if that would be of interest. I didn't do it in this analysis, but it's something that I have the, I, I could do. Um, maybe we can do that when we do the uh, follow-up on the southern section of Chestnut Plain Road. So let's see. So Lori, did you calibrate each each location before you took the data? Before you yeah, yeah. Um, we actually, um, because uh, we didn't really do our normal um, traffic counting program this season, um, every year annually we calibrate the devices. Um, actually, there's another device that you use to calibrate the counting devices. Um, <clears throat> but so they were all calibrated and tuned up uh, just like a couple weeks before we deployed them. So we're pretty confident in these. But you didn't do it at each location as you set up though? No, no. Okay. So your and your accuracy is probably plus or minus what, two to three? Yeah, yeah, it's not. Yeah, you're right. For this, they're not as accurate as the lidar or radar right. that the police might use for spot speed studies. Um, but okay, but yeah, please. I would think yeah, within two percent. Right. Okay. Please proceed. Oh, go ahead. Okay, we had one more location. Yeah, that was Haydenville Road. Um, so we did Haydenville Road. Um. The, the um, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, reports say um, between H uh, Dickinson Hill and Masterson Road, the device uh, was um, really just a few hundred feet or yards, sorry, um, north of Dickinson Hill. So it's closer to Dickinson than to Masterson, um, but it was in that segment there. Um, and here, that section, I believe, is also a uh, speed limit 40. Um, and we were seeing the 85th percentile speed there is about 48 miles per hour um, with the pace group of between 38 and 47 miles per hour. Um, this is where we saw the highest speed was uh, seven, someone hit 71 miles per hour. Oh, I thought someone was higher on river. I thought they got to be 76 or something on river. 76. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. Yep. Yeah. So. Um, slightly higher number of violations there because um, they're sort of uh, just the lower speed limit there, basically. Um, I don't think I have past year speed data for this section of Haydenville Road, 
so I couldn't say um, if this is an increase or a decrease. Um, I just want you guys to know, I actually, um, I live in Chesterfield. Um, before, um, before I started working from home, I worked in Greenfield, and, and I travel that route. I take Haydenville Road, Chestnut Plain Road, and jump over to 5 and 10 daily basis, every day, both ways. So I'm very familiar with um, both of those roadways, and just so from my experience. Um, I feel like it's probably similar to what it was before the pandemic, speeding wise. Laurie? Yes. Yeah. I have a I have a question for you in regards to working off the 85 percentile, and and if if the town wants to approach like Mass DOT and we go looking for money, what what does Mass DOT or what would be considered a good you know, or uh, I should maybe say a poor number to be eligible or likely to get money um, if we're competing with other towns that are also saying that traffic is speeding and we're looking to do traffic calming measures, um, like Chestnut Plain Road, for instance, if we're already, you know, our, our 85 percentile isn't really, it's not outside of the, what's the police department is considering enforceable, yeah. It How is, likely are we to ever get any money? I mean, uh, funding from MassDOT for traffic calming, um, I mean, it would, it's sort of a, they, they want to see you do a lot, like every other measure first before they do some dramatic geometric changes or, um, and, uh, uh, the, the 30, the, the 85th percentile speed you see there is more than five miles per hour over the posted speed. So in that regard, you would definitely say that there is a speeding issue there, um, whether or not, not you know, the, the police want to enforce things above more than five miles per hour above the posted speed. But the 85th percentile speed is almost 10 miles per hour higher than the posted speed. So I would consider that that you have a speeding issue there. Um, as far as traffic coming, though, I mean, you, you have the the, uh, the sidewalk project coming in, that complete right. streets project, and that involves a lot of treatments that are also the same type of treatments that are recommended as what they what they call I don't know if they have a new term of art for it, but we used to call it a couple of years ago. They called the low cost safety fixes, right? Maybe a bigger stop sign, maybe a slow down sign, maybe narrowing the lanes, those kinds of things. Um, so the crosswalks, that's a traffic calming thing. I think that there, there's one by Christian Lane. There's going to be a crosswalk across Haydenville Road. Uh, I, I, I believe that even across Chestnut Plant at Haydenville Road. So there would actually be two within that section. And then I don't know if the project that you have implemented now is you're about to implement is going to go south of Haydenville Road, but there are similar treatments in that next section of the the, the um, complete streets project. So I definitely think MassDOT would definitely want you to wait to complete those treatments and then reevaluate what the speed is like after those things have been in place for a few months at least. Um, okay. Speaking like from my experience, most of these drivers, including myself, um, do this regularly, do this route regularly. It's, and those are the folks who are speeding. Those are the folks who are, are comfortable. They're like, I know this road. I know what to expect. I'm just going to do whatever, you know, I feel like I, you know, feels appropriate and to get me to my destination um, as, you know, on time. <clears throat> the last thing I wanted to say about that also, Laurie, I, I really do think it will be beneficial to break down the you know, the type, the classifications of the vehicles as far okay. as the speeding. And, and that'll be big if we, just to know if, are the trucks speeding yeah. or are it, is it the cars that are speeding? Because it seems like the biggest report that I hear from the residents, they really think that this, it's the trucks that are speeding. It's the trucks that are speeding. Mm. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. It, it wouldn't be much. I can definitely get look into that and get that mm. to you pretty Although the noise that they the that is the, the noise complaint would be there regardless of whether trucks are speeding. Yeah, that's sort of their bringing and thing. Yeah, and I know. Yeah, I don't know. 
about the the Jake break thing. I I feel like that that's sort of a that's a misnomer thing. Like no one's actually using Jake breaks there. If they do that, the trade I'm pretty sure that's well. a violation. A movie no, they, they they do have horrendously noisy breaks, whether they're really called Jake breaks or not. Yeah, it's, they're just breaking. They're just slowing that, down and breaking. Yeah, they're not doing it's it's, it's an uns it's a, a sort of an additional braking system that tractor trailers will have that they're supposed to use in emergencies and it, it does make quite a racket, or at least it used to in the past. But they are at least on on state highways and in the mass dot maintained roads, they're they're prohibited unless it's an emergency. Um, so if you're just hearing regular braking noises, it's just trucks braking. They're heavier and they have bigger brakes and they just are noisier. Yeah, but I, I would I would add to that just two things because I get a lot of the traffic that is peripheral to or continuing from Chestnut Plain Road. Um, you know, and I know that it, it's you can tell the difference between the Jake brake and the just noisy, lousy brakes. Um, they 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 use them going up Swamp Road, so okay, you know, so, yeah, you know, going up. I remind, huh. um, but also I think the speed. I I wonder because I noticed the speed, and just because a truck is so much bigger, you can't help but notice it much mm -hmm. more than a car speeding, and that may be part of the reason why. And it's just and it's just startling to you to see a, a, a truck fly by your house, much more yeah. so than a car. So it may be optics at some level as well on, on the on the speed of the truck yeah. versus the car. Yeah, and that is I mean it is it's true that the, the heavy trucks are speeding. That is sort of a more significant safety issue because they're they're heavy trucks. Um, they take um, longer to break and slow down, and they are traveling that it would be a larger impact if they were to, to strike something. So, um. Okay, I have a few comments I want to make here before we get moving on. I think for the, the, the Jake break or truck noise, uh, what, I, what I've seen is surrounding communities, they put signs up to alert trucks that it's prohibited or, or don't do it. Uh, I showed Brian uh, earlier, this week, an example of a sign in, in Northampton on, on uh, uh, Bridge Bridge Road, uh, and there's also one on, on in Northfield. I, I think going into Northfield, I think it's and maybe State Route 10, or or it could be the Town Road, where they uh, have signs up uh, reminding truckers they don't use jig brakes, or if you do, there, there's a fine. Uh, for violating that, I, I think something like that would would help if we we could put a sign up uh, on uh, on Chestnut Plain where where people are saying trucks use use their brakes or, or engine noise to slow down. I, I think that's that's something we could very easily do. Get look at the signs that other people are using, uh, and even if we're not sure, I I guess. Call Northfield uh, Highway Department and ask them the signs you put up for for truck noise. Are they working? Are they effective? Do you know uh, how long they've been up? Uh, is it make a difference? Uh, talk to somebody, and and I think that may be a, an easy, low cost solution to to try to see if it adjusts, if it reduces the truck noise, engine noise. The other part of it is there is at least two. Trucking companies that probably go through that intersection and on Chestnut Plain every day. You've got two trucking companies that have several uh, heavy equipment dump trucks in town that leave every morning and come back. Uh, could write a letter to, I would suggest to write a letter to the two trucking companies, at least the two we know of, that live there and tell them people in town are concerned about truck noise and appreciate it if they would be more cognizant of that when they're driving through town and even get them to tell other people they know, other trucking companies that they work with that go through town that we're concerned about the truck noise in town. I mean, that's an easy solution to, to look at that. The, the other thing, okay, jumping back over to uh, the speed studies here. I guess, you know, we, we've got three locations here that 
were identified with with speeds uh, exceeding the speed limit, and there's there's probably other locations in town. Well, Jonathan mentioned one. There's probably in Chestnut Plain is another one. Uh, I guess I would like to see our, our police department here develop a speed monitoring program where they look at this data that Lori has provided and decide at least these three locations or surrounding what is the best time for them to be out there to enforce speed limits. I mean, you're not going to, it doesn't make sense to, to focus on the driver going 68 miles an hour because that's a rare occurrence and it could happen any day and it's at four in the morning. So that has no impact on, on the overall speeds. Uh, I guess I would like to see our police department set up a plan of how they're going to monitor these and other locations in, in town, whether it's uh, having a, a, a policeman there with a, with, a, with a radar unit monitoring speeds or, or, or whether the signing needs to, needs to, needs to be different. Or, or even parking a vehicle. You've got three vehicles. I, I don't know the condition of the third vehicle. Park the third vehicle in the uh, uh, library driveway overnight. Sometimes presence of a vehicle forces people to slow down. And, and I guess, and also try to focus, I guess, the police department focus on traffic surveillance more on some of the town roads. I see in the lodge, you're on State Road, you're at the park and ride lot. Uh, yeah, it, it's nice to do that, but, but I think some of that needs to be refocused on, on town roads. And, and getting, getting back to the, some of the data here, you know, the ones that are within, like on this one, within 30 mi 39 miles an hour, I guess you're probably not going to change the driving habits of them people. It's the ones over 39, and you can see in Lori's data, there's there's a definite cutoff by, by mileage groups, by speed limit groups. Like here it could be over 45 or over 50, where it does drastically go down from, say, 500 up to a, down to 100. If you focus on them 100 vehicles that are speeding, look at the time of day the, them 100 vehicles are going through, and that's where you set up your traffic monitoring to try to control them 100 vehicles. You're not going to control 1,300 that are going over the speed limit, and it's a waste of time to look at the one going 68 miles an hour. I guess that's something I'd like to see our police department get involved in. Look at some of this data and, and arrange your, your workforce to, and equipment to... to to monitor some of these conditions and hopefully people will reduce the speed. I mean, if you don't do anything and say, well, we're going to put more signs up or something, I don't know how effective that, that, that is going to be. The other thing that I guess we didn't fund and it still could happen is uh, I think the, the police department wanted uh, remote speed limit signs, right, to one or two location, one or two signs we're looking for to, to put at various locations to monitor speed and tell people flashing speed limit sign how fast they were going. I guess that's still a possibility. If uh, I think it, part of this speed monitoring program is where you think you want to put them. If you're not effective on controlling speed on River Road, maybe one of them signs may be working there. Or on Chestnut Plain Road, maybe that's where to put one of them signs. But I think the police department needs to get more involved and do something with this, with this data, this information. And I guess I would, I would like to see a plan come from our chief, I guess within the next month, by the end of, end of August, or meaning in August, I'd like to see some plan for us to, to see what you're doing, how you would address this. I'll offer my expertise and services and traffic monitoring and speed help you develop that plan if you want. But I think it's worthwhile to at least develop a plan and see what we can do with this. Maybe the end result, well, it doesn't make any difference, but at least we, we tried and, and we focused on some of these locations. Do, Jim, do you have any, 
I caught you off guard, I guess, asking you to do something. What is... That's not catching me off guard. I was just Does that waiting. Seem like, I was just waiting for you to finish. Does that seem something reasonable that you could put together? Uh, Fred, I mean, I've been doing this for 23 years. This, right. this is this is what this is what we do. Traffic enforcement. We do these these types of things. This is why a year and a half ago I I started looking into these signs and requested to get four signs because I know there's a problem, and I wanted to gather that data. And that was the first step in doing it. We didn't get those signs, so we requested that the FERCOG do the study on these three roads. So this is this has been in the works for over a year. Um, this yeah. isn't something that we're dragging our feet on. This isn't something that I'm sitting back going, oh, there's no problem. We're, we're out there every day patrolling. You see what's entered into the log, but you don't see the the dozen or so trips that, that each officer takes every day up and down Chestnut Plain Road and sitting at the library and sitting in different spots. Those aren't all put into the log. Some of them are, but they're not all. They're not all put in there. And, and, and when we're you're looking at three, yeah. we're looking at three roads. We we probably have twenty roads in town where there's the same exact problem. Right. So this, this is a problem all around town. This is why I was looking for another full time officer to get more people out there to do traffic enforcement because during the day when I'm doing administrative stuff, I can't be out on the road doing mm -hmm. these traffic programs. So this is why I was looking for that. So this has been in the works for two years. Well, so I, I think to say that I'm not to say that we're not doing anything. I think is is you know, doing a little discredit to a, to the police department and the work that our officers are doing out there. Well, it's How it's not it's not people? visible. It's not visible to me, and and I guess the people on Chestnut Plain Road don't maybe don't see that is uh, making it a, is that occurring either. And but I think the the other benefit to some of the data Lori put together is, is to narrow down your, your hours and where you want to really do traffic monitoring at either these locations or similar. She showed us where-, where Absolutely, this, this is what I said two years ago. Speeds are- That's speeding. why I wanted these signs. So- <laughs> Joyce, okay. what were you gonna say? Joyce, you uh, had something? Yeah, yeah. Is there, um, and maybe people, I mean, I think you're right. If, if I don't see you out there pulling someone over for speeding, then I don't think it ever happens, right? Mm -hmm. If I mean yeah. that typically, right? Um, and uh, I think from the letters, it sounds like people think that no one has ever stopped for speeding on Haydenville Road because if people drove by on their regular trip and saw somebody pulled over for speeding, then word would get out. Um, so maybe what we need is to let people know what, how much is done, like how, like how many hours per week are your officers doing that? And that's, um, you say it's not in your logs because it's not an incident, but it, I wonder, is there a way to keep track of that that's not gonna be too onerous that we can maybe be able to let people know? Um, you know, so many hours, you don't have to say when so people don't know, yep. right? <laughs> but you could say how many hours spent on Haydenville Road, how many hours spent in different places um, doing uh, uh, traffic monitoring. And that, that might actually be helpful for people to know that because like, I never saw you, oh, but you were out there for six, somebody was out there for six hours randomly the, uh, per week or whatever the number happens to be. Hmm. Then that actually might be a helpful, um, helpful thing to do. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah Joyce's point is, is a very valid one, but you only see, and, and Fred, I would caution that, you know, we, we, we see, where police are when they're around where we live or where we drive on a regular basis. We don't know. I have no idea how often police run River Road because I don't travel on River Road that often. I know when they're on Chestnut Plain or Haydenville because I travel that, that, that route a little bit more. So we, we, we see our own world a lot more than we see other people's worlds. And, and so we have to be very cautious not to just assume something's not happening because it's not, it's not visible. Um, yeah. You know, I would love to see police yeah. On, on Swamp Road. But I also know that Swamp Road's a <coughs> road. Um, you know, so I, I, I think we need to, to take into consideration where the large amounts of traffic are. I think it's a fair judgment to say that those roads with more out of town traffic will get higher speeds. And Jim, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that you tend not to you, 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 you tend not to uh, 
break the rules in your own house, but you tend to. Break I wish them. I wish that were the case, but it's the other way around. Is it really? You get more speed Absolutely. from Waitley? Absolutely, and the people that are complaining. Well, yeah, I get that, yeah. but you get more people speeding who live in Waitley than outside of Waitley. Waitley or, or Hatfield? I stand corrected, right. and I apologize. It, it's it's pretty frequent. You'd be surprised, and that's why I encourage people to do a ride along with us, so we can drive around town, and you can you can watch your neighbors, you can watch the people that go by us speeding. Oh, you yeah. can. I, uh, I encourage anybody to do that, I, including people that complain. You, I'll I'll come to your house. We'll we'll go out and we'll do some radar. You can estimate the speed of the vehicle. We can we can capture the speed of the vehicle with the radar. I've I've done that for years and years and years, and nine times out of ten. People's estimations of speed are way off. I've got people on, on Chestnut Plain Road that tell me that there's cars all day long that are going 70 and 80 miles an hour down long, down Chestnut Plain Road. All day long. I, yeah. I know it's not happening. You've got the one or two, which I know. We've stopped them. We've cited them. They're probably going to be losing their licenses shortly, and then we'll see them speeding again, and then we'll arrest them for driving without a license. It's the same battle that we fight, we fight day in and day out all around town. These are just three roads that came up because you know people voiced their concerns, which is perfectly understandable. But I, I can't sit on a road in this town without somebody stopping and telling me, sit in my driveway, because people speed, speed by my house all the time. And we go and we sit in their driveway and I leave notes at the station, go sit in this person's driveway. They offered to, to have us sit there. So we'll go and sit there. And sometimes they come out, sometimes they do radar with us. So we, we've been doing these things for years. It's some, sometimes it's you know one officer covering 21 square miles. It's it's difficult to to really have a, a major impact on traffic. <clears throat> traffic how hard would it be to have somebody out there at uh, five o'clock in the morning when the truck traffic starts on Haydenville Road and uh, when the noise complaints are happening? How how difficult is that? What you said? Yeah. Do we um, have like is that like hours that we don't normally have someone on duty or? Yeah, no, we normally don't. I, I usually come in at 7. I've come in at 6. I've come in at 5. Okay. I, I've come in numerous days. I, yeah, so we don't normally recently, have someone on between roughly midnight and or maybe 2 a.m. and Correct, and people know that, and that's why, yeah. they, that's why they speed at 6.30 in the morning. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because I, we know I, we're not there. I still think I, I like to see something from you, Jim, and if you want to call it a plan or, or a description of what you're doing for speed monitoring in the town and how are you using this data? Uh, whether it's one page or 50 pages, I, I guess I, I would still like to see that. I think it's gonna inform the, the residents that you are doing something, you are concerned, you're making an effort. We're not gonna criticize because you didn't do it. Uh -huh, I, we I just don't wanna publicize what you're doing and, yeah. and maybe you'll get feedback from people saying, oh, we didn't know all this was going on or yeah. that's, that's great that we're, that we're doing that. Uh, I, 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 put, I, I put this information in, in request when we were looking at the signs and this is what I wanted to use the data for. Yep. So this is, I mean, this is great that I have this data on these three roads right now. I mean, it's, it's something I could turn around tomorrow. I've already got a list of the, the times and the roads that to have our officers be out there. It's already Jim, implemented. Jim, the speed signs that you see out there, do they register data or is that just a snapshot that move, goes away? The, one, the ones that I want to get, the ones you see in Deerfield, Hatfield, Sunderland's got one or two of them now, um, those all collect data. They collect similar, similar data to what we've got from um, the FERCOG, but it uses, it uses radar to capture the speed of the vehicle, which is calibrated and tested. So it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be more accurate than, than the tube counters. And, and what do those run? $2,800 a piece. And, and Lori, did you say, I'm sorry, I, I, apologize if I, I apologize if I missed it. Are there funding sources for those types of? Um, yeah, um, some small sources, yeah. And I'm pretty sure um, that was one of the sort of pro, uh, line items in your complete streets um, prioritization plan. I don't recall if that was in your first round application or not, but that would be my first suggestion as far as statewide funding sources. Um, for, for those types of signs. Yeah, that's definitely an eligible um, activity under the Complete Streets program. Okay, Lori, are you aware of, of other 
towns our size uh, or any size, I guess, that have a say a speed monitoring plan or program that you could share with us? Um, honestly, no, I'm not. Um, I can look into um, what might be done in sort of in some of uh, some other regions, but within Franklin County, um, that's. Mm, yeah, you, you, you want to reach out, I, I guess, to, to, to other um, police departments, um, but uh, I'm not aware of any town that has like a sort of a, a publicized, I'm not aware of how most police departments um, enact um, speed enforcement. Right, or, or at least the ones that you did speed studies for, what they did with the information and are you... Yeah, are you um, no, I mean, typically, I mean, typically what we'll get is a <clears throat> just a request for a traffic count. Um, and maybe one of the reasons for that excuse me, um, is because of speeding. Um, and I'll be honest with you, um, these, um, these detailed speed analysis reports that, that, that we did for you, um, that's something that's new for us this year. Um, we, we got some new software that sort of makes this a lot uh, the the it makes a lot more use of the data that the, at the ATRs collect. Um, so this is sort of something new that we're implementing this year, and we were sort of promoting it to our member towns um, uh, as um, an activity that we could do sort of during this um, pandemic uh, response summer on uh, something that a lot of towns are concerned about. Obviously, um, you're not really not the only town that is concerned about speeding on your local roads. Um, <clears throat> so I don't really have any feedback yet as far as how other towns have implemented that. A few other towns have requested these kind of data from us. Um, let me see, Sunderland and Northfield are the first two. Yeah, those are the two I think we did. And actually Leverett, Leverett did ask for a couple of speed studies there. But so I'm not sure what they've done with that data yet. Um, we did these counts sort of in uh, June and July. Okay, Brian, can we go back to, to the letter that uh, the uh, Chess and Plain people uh, provided and see how we're going to address these? Uh, uh, I think it's important to, to uh, respond to, to this letter and, and if we can decide on, on some plan of action, maybe to put some uh, discussion in it, how we plan on addressing these either now or in the, in the future. I, I think we owe these people a response. It, uh, uh, okay, the stop sign we talked we talked about, uh, maybe it's police enforcement more than, than anything that can be done. Uh, truck noise, guy mentioned uh, putting up signs, writing a letter to trucking companies. Fred, could I just jump in as far as putting up signs? Okay. Uh, I, Keith may be able to correct me, but uh, this is a this is a town ordinance thing that has to be voted on. So I don't think you could just throw up signs saying you can't use your Jake brakes. It's it's a town ordinance that there would be a finable offense for that. So I don't think it's just as simple as throwing up signs. I think you'd have to implement an ordinance for it. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I think that's right, Chief. Um, that it, if it's not a statewide a statewide regulation, which I'm not sure if it is a statewide regulation that applies to local roads, someone would have to look into that. But it's I, not, I yeah. what I'm aware of is towns implementing a local ordinance, which makes me think that that's sort of the, the path that you need to take. Mm -hmm. Well, what would it take for the town to have an ordinance for that? Town, me town, town meeting vote. Town meeting vote, okay. So can you, research that and provide languages to what would be required for a town meeting vote? I mean, I, I mean, that Brian could probably obtain from the towns that do have it. Yeah, I've, I've got I've got the CMR for it. I mean, it's um, I can get that to Brian. I mean, it's it's not that difficult to to find it. But um. so can can either Keith or Lori explain to me the difference between a Jake break or an engine break? the same it's the yeah. same thing jake brake is a brand name it's actually called it's a jacobs break but he right. calls it jake's break is that the same thing as 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 if a truck downshifts going down a hill and it gets louder 
Is, well, again, is that different? again, what you're doing is a, the, an engine brake is using the compression of the engine to retard the the airflow through the. You're basically shutting off the airflow through the engine, which is yep. then using the the compression of the engine to slow the truck down. Yep. So and when I had it different from just downshifting. It is different than downshifting. Does downshifting make that noise? Yeah, I mean, yes, it will because your engine, if you just downshift without your engine brake on, your engine is going to increase in RPM. speed, in, you know, RPMs, the revolution. Right? The RPMs are going to increase, which is going to sound loud, louder. So so what, what do we think the problem is then in this area? Well, there is no doubt about it. There are some trucks that have louder engine brakes than others. Um, and that's that varies from one manufacturer vehicle to another. Yeah, the mufflers that they use for them. Yeah, some some of them. I guarantee you, the majority of them are using them. Just some of them you don't hear because of the muffler type of muffler that they have on there, where some of them you do hear. Yeah. So the noise is is not created by the just downshifting going down Chestnut Plain Road. I'm not asking that in any certain terms, but. No, it would be when they, when they take their foot off the gas to coast down the hill, the engine keeps them going at a slower speed. So that's all it is. So they don't have to use – it's a safety thing, so they don't have to ride their brakes down the hill, heat their brakes up, and then not be able to stop. That's that's why they use it, to avoid using the brakes. Right. <clears throat> yeah, I guess I, I, I'm, I'm fine with us doing lots of work on the speeding, but I I don't think that that's the cause of the noise. I don't think it's speeding trucks. I think just trucks, trucks are yeah. noisy and mm -hmm. the people nearby there are, you know, they're hearing it partly because it's, you know, it's an intersection where we do want the trucks to stop. But they're going to make noise when they stop. We want them to come to a stop and then they have to accelerate. They make noise when they accelerate. So I don't know if, if trucks are supposed to make that much noise. Um, I don't know if we can enforce things like, hey, don't you don't have a muffler on this or things like that. I mean, because cars are supposed to have mufflers. Um, so I, I sort of think the speed stuff is, is good because people are complaining about the speeds. But I don't think it's going to come to the, the other problem that people were reporting. And so I don't really know exactly what to do about that. But um, my professionals are here. So. Okay. But we don't really know where the truck noise is. Is it people stopping at the intersection by the, by the Whitley Inn or is it going down, the, going down the hill or going the other way, I guess? As it's been described to me, the noise is uh, trucks coming to a stop of some sort at that intersection, at the T intersection, yeah. and then turning uh, and to uh, say go north on Chestnut Plain Road. I think most of them will go north and then go over Christian Lane or Swamp Road, um, uh, that, that that's where the noise is. That, and that, that, that's the complaint as it's been described to me. That's that's more than a mile, maybe a mile and a half, maybe Keith would know better, a mile and a half, mile and three quarters of just downhill. So the yep. trucks are trying to avoid using their brakes and they're coasting all the way through Haydenville, all the way down Chestnut Plain and all the way down Swamp Road. I really think it's it's that it's that intersection when they have to come to a stop that's when they're really really noisy and then then they have to accelerate again they're noisy again I mean it's be, yeah, just because trucks are noisy yeah that that wouldn't be that wouldn't be the the compression brakes or the engine brakes that's that's when your speed's higher and you're coming down right. the hill yeah, that's exactly yeah. what I'm talking about I, I think it may not be related to speed and it may not be Jake brakes it, uh, although that that may be contributing, I, I, I'm just I'm just expressing um, a thought that we, we really have to understand our problem better, maybe. I think the simplest thing is we know there are other towns right here in Franklin County that are including like Northampton that have they've taken it upon themselves. They've they've voted at their town meetings to implement it. Why don't we ask them? It, did it make a difference or is it is it helpful and if they say no we didn't notice any difference at all then that's 
there's your data. Yeah, I, I agree. That's something that, that should be done, yes. And I don't know where that would come from, a public works department or, or the police department. Police probably would know if it's impacting trucks, truck traffic, truck speeds, car speeds. I, I can certainly make some phone calls. That's not a, it's not a problem. I know, I, I don't know if Bernardston actually implemented it or not. I know they're trying to, um, but I know Bernardston and uh, Northampton are the only ones that, that I know of around the, here. The location I'm thinking of, is it Northfield? I thought it was Northfield, maybe Bernardston, I don't know. Yeah, when, it could when, be right on the line somewhere. When you get off the Interstate 91, you come to a T intersection shortly, okay. and you turn left right after that. Is that Northfield? That's yeah. Bernardston. No, it depends on what exit you're talking about. <laughs> Well, the one for Northfield. Was it 20, 28? Yeah, something like that. I yeah, if you take a left, that goes to Northfield. If you take a, yeah. if you take a left, that goes to Bernstein. If you take a right, that goes to Northfield. Now, I, I know the sign he's talking about. It's yeah. in the center of Northfield. Yeah. Okay. So you're saying at the end of Route 10 where you take a left, not off of 91. Right. Right. Okay, okay. it's off of 10, yeah. Okay. So Northfield. And that, that sign is, is a little different wording than the one in Northampton. So, and, and I don't know if the MUTCD has suggested signs for that condition or not. No. No? Okay. No, it's, that's not a, a, that's something that each a town can take upon themselves. It's not something like that Mass DOT or the MUTCD has. Yeah. At least okay. I don't believe so, Fred. Okay. But I also know having traveled that road a lot, um, when you take a left on it going into, into Northfield, the, that road prior to the left coming from 91 is very heavily monitored by um, police departments. I mean, it is, there, there is significant police presence. So if you're, spe if you're traveling that road with any knowledge of that road at all, you're nuts. Yeah. If you're going to speed, it's sort of like speeding past the deer, the South Deerfield Water District building. You're crazy. Yeah. Um, but I have one other suggestion as far as uh, investigating the truck noise. Um, it's not something that I have much experience with um, truck noise, local road truck noise studies. But I do know um, that you may be able to get some insight from the Mass State Police Commercial Vehicle Enforcement Unit. Um, they sort of will cover sort of any violations by commercial vehicles. Um, they've been helpful to other towns um, enforcing um, the weight limit on weight restricted bridges. Um, so I don't have, again, I don't have that contact information right here with me, but um, they may have some sort of like guidance and suggestions about how to go about addressing truck noise. That's it. Yeah, I, I, I have contact with them as okay. well. Yep. Yeah, this sort of occurred to me. I, like, oh, I don't know a lot about this, but I, I, I know a, a trooper who does. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, um, I'm thinking about some of the other suggestions that are in this letter on Chestnut Plain Road. Um, stop sign at the end of Christian Lane. I guess that's talking about changing the, the yield sign to a stop sign. Um, before that, I would just you know, maybe refresh and replace the yield sign. Um, there's a yield pavement markings that are have been proliferated in the MUTCD in the last, I would say, 10 years of sawtooth triangle lines. Um, that's just sort of another sort of feedback to a driver that, hey, I should check what I'm doing as I go through this intersection. Um, just the configuration of that intersection, I'm not sure that throwing up a stop sign there is going to increase safety. Um, it might, it, it will slow, it would slow trucks down or drivers down once they got used to the stop sign and stopped running the stop sign. Um, <laughs> you know, you, you're going slower if you have to start from a stop, but 
but um, I'd, be, I'd uh, be careful with that. Um, the reinforcement speed signs, we talked about that, and the enforcement, and then the historical district signage, I think that was, again, another um, lower down priority in the complete streets prioritization plan was just sort of some walkability and sort of uh, informational signage. Um, but um, I think um, the, as, as I said before, I think that the treatments that the, the new sidewalks and the crosswalks um, that are coming in with the uh, upcoming project, we want to, I think, um, waiting and see what sort of effect those have would, would be very interesting. Um, and yeah, basically, um, for traffic safety and speed safety um, specifically, sort of the the yeah, mantra that we have um, in traffic engineer or traffic transportation planning, and I'm sure Jim has heard this before, but there's three E's to traffic safety, um, especially with speeding, and there's the three E's. It's engineering, enforcement, and education. And those three should all work together. And I think what we're talking about here is, is we're moving in that direction. And honestly, those speed feedback signs that collect the data, they kind of combine all three of these, you know? Um, because they they um, they are engineered, you know, you locate them in the place where they're going to um, get the most attention and have the most um, value to to the drivers. Um, they're going to collect that data, so that's going to um, help with enforcement. And also, um, as folks know and learn a little bit more about this, is kind of a new technology. I don't know if everybody knows that it records speeds or it can record speeds. But sort of that sort of information getting out to the drivers and the general public, then they're going to know when they see that sign. They're like, oh, people are paying attention to the speed that I'm traveling here. Maybe I should check myself. Okay. Okay. My other point about those signs is that they are most effective if they are, um, if, you, if they're not permanent. So okay. that they can kind of move around a little bit. Like, you know, like in Williamsburg, they'll have one on that section of Mountain Road. Sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's in some other part of town. So just sort of, you know, keeping them up for like three months and moving them somewhere else and then bringing them back, sort of, um, that's just sort of a, a recommendation when, when you do acquire some of those is to keep them moving. Okay, so uh, Brian, do you have enough information here to respond to their requests? I can okay. convey to them what, what we discussed tonight. Can you draft something up and we can, you want us to look at it at another meeting? It's, it's really up to you guys how you wanna, how you wanna proceed with this. So if I could just add, so like I said, we're already in the process of implementing um, proactive solutions to this by looking at the times and getting enforcement out there, targeted traffic enforcement, which unfortunately we haven't, we haven't been doing since the whole coronavirus thing. Um, we've, we've been doing limited interactions with the motoring public, um, just for everybody's safety, um, but we can certainly um, start working on, on doing this. Um, the question I have is, so we have data now that shows what the speeds are. We go out and we do enforcement. What are we gonna use as a judge to say that it's working? Are we gonna be able to do the study again? I'm not sure as far as the Council of Governments, if, if they'd be willing to come back out to provide the, the same equipment so we could do the study again and say two or three months after we've had time to do some enforcement out there, or how that would work. I, I, I guess you may know sooner if your enforcement is working by your, your presence out there and what, what you're seeing happening. Well, I, can, I, I can guarantee it. I guarantee if I go out there right now, yeah. Their, their, their cars aren't going to be going that fast. Right, I know that. They're doing it when we're not there, so that's right. that's the. Well, that's I guess why you got to try to focus on some hours and and try to yeah. figure out what's the the best time to be there. Uh, if they provided us with that, yeah. 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 So. Okay. Hey Jim, what about the concept of parking the third? 
patrol car okay. somewhere at different times. It's it's been mentioned before. I mean, I I don't have any real objection to it. I'm ju I'm just a little leery about leaving the police cruiser parked on the side of the road, especially this day and age. I mean, police Honestly, cars are being targeted. I, I, I'm not sure that your concern is, you know, I, you know, I, I just, I don't know. I, and, and besides it's the third vehicle that was never used anyway. So if yeah. something happens to it, oh, well. Yeah, no, it's, it's not my, it's not my property. <laughs> it's, it's the town's property. So if you want me to put it out there, I'll put it out there. If it gets damaged, I'll so park it. <laughs> Yeah, I'm asking if you think it's helpful. I, I, I think it's helpful when people see a, a car sitting there. Yeah. Um, like if I'm sitting there doing radar, people are going to slow down. Cars are going to flash their lights to the next oncoming cars, which they do all the time. They're going to mark us on Waze and Google Maps. They're going to do all the same stuff they normally do. Yeah. So, you know, the, the kind of the jig is up in five minutes and everybody knows that we're there anyways. Um, but, you know, are we going to leave it there for a day, two days? I mean, I don't know that it's going to be effective after the first five minutes. You'd once, have to, once people realize that nobody's in the car. Right. I'm just asking. I, you know. Yeah. Yep. Well, you can try it and you see. Try it. it. Yeah. You can move it around and, and maybe put it locations like you think are safe, like maybe the center school or, or a yeah. library driveway or, or somewhere like that. that yeah. So, yeah, so, so, Fred, that. so Fred's volunteering to pick me up and drive me around sure, <laughs> so I can that, move the car. Yeah, I'll get the mask on. 5 a.m., yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mask. yeah, but All I right. think Jim's got a really good point that how will we know if this is effective if we don't have another set of data? And I don't know that the FERCOG does, will do this for us again in three months. Um, what, it, what would be a realistic time frame for having a, another speed study done? Um, I, I think, it, at least under these circumstances, I think doing this again in three months would be, we, I'd have no objection to that. We have the resources for that. Um, honestly, like I said, we're doing a reduced traffic counting program this season, so um, I, can't, I can't give you a, an exact calendar date, but we'd be definitely okay. willing to come back and do that and again, and I'd say three, well, let's say we did this in, well, you want to say three months from now, assuming uh, enforcement is going to pick up after this? Yeah. I don't know. I, I think from August 1st. Yeah. And, and we're weeks, talking maybe since just now, we're talking specifically about uh, Chestnut Plain Road. I'd be happy when we're out there, we could do the, redo this northern section of Chestnut Plain, put one down in the southern section so we have some uh, current data on that. Um, did you want to see a repeat on Haydenville Road? Um, like I said, I really don't see a, a speeding as, as a problem, uh, regulatory speeding as a problem on River Road. So I, I, I wouldn't recommend doing that. Just. I think the, the, the timing and when to do it may depend some on the economic conditions. I mean, if we're still dealing in the, the pandemic situation here, the three months, four months from now, yes, because you've got the same travel conditions than most people. But if everything, say, opens up and schools are open and all, you're getting a different kind of, of traffic out there. And that's going to make a difference yeah, just but by the, itself. But the change will be bigger the longer we wait. So I think the change well, could be. similar conditions are by doing it sooner. Sooner, yeah, you'd have similar, hopefully, conditions, or, or not hopefully, but conditions to compare to. And maybe your volumes would tell you that as well when you're out there, whether you're dealing with the same amount of traffic as well. Yeah, so. yeah I'd be curious to do it um, for my own information to see what the, how the volume has changed within three months, just as part of our, our own sort of regional traffic volume monitoring. So that's, that's OK, nice. so Ryan, I guess I would help you draft up a letter if you want a review a letter you draft up with input from our from Jim I guess as to what he feels he's going to be doing more now to monitor speeds or what he's doing maybe to monitor speeds and how he could help uh, appease these people on Chestnut Plain Road. Is that agree everybody agreeable? 
and whether you do it, you pick the time, whether you want it by the next meeting or, or the end of next month. Does that seem like a acceptable yeah, approach? That sounds like a better amount of time. Yeah, to hear back. Okay, we can share it. Well, maybe at the next, if we want the next uh, next meeting, if you have it by then. Not the not the August fifth, but the what twelfth. Sure. Okay. Okay. Anything else for uh, Lori or or on? Uh, well, we got the we got the chief still to, to talk about his uh, contract here. Uh, yeah, um, I just have one last thing. Um, I brought it up before and just wanted to remind you, I will do um, rerun the speed data um, for Chestnut Plain Road um, and, and get you speed data for each different classification of vehicles so you can, can see you know, what percent of trucks are speeding, what percent of cars are speeding. Um, would you want to see that for the other roadways as well? Maybe for Haydenville Road? I would think if it's not too much trouble, yeah. Yeah. And and um, um, in the same vein, Jim, um, when you get a chance to look at the complete speed reports, if you could just let me know what um, what of that data is useful to you and what's not, because um, like I said, this is the first sort of season that uh, we've been able to generate that type of report. So yeah. just think back you have about what what's valuable there, and if there's some some other kind of breakdown that you'd like to see. Just to yeah, absolutely. Out. I've already got some notes on it. There's a couple of things. So. Yeah, I'm going to give you the, whatever is the most useful to you. So, yep. so I'd be happy to hear, hear from you about that. Um, yeah, so I can get you that um, the, the vehicle speed, the vehicle classification speed breakdown. Um, I can get that to you next week so you can have it to discuss at your next meeting. Okay. You know, Lori, what would be helpful? Yeah, I did look at all the, the tables and graphs and they're called bar graphs or whatever you provided, uh, it, it would be helpful maybe explain what you're showing there or, or what's what's the critical item on the, on the graph that we should be looking at. Right. Uh, some of them I've never seen displayed that way. And of course, now I know you can get all kind of uh, uh, data analysis that you can yeah. do with this data, but okay. just pick one location or if you're gonna do it on Chestnut Plain, uh, Tell us what, what, what we should be looking at is this uh, for okay. this information. All right, yeah, that's good. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Okay, thank you, Lori. All right, thanks, so. I'll see you later. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Right. Okay, moving on. Uh, we're about an hour, almost an hour late. Okay. Uh, our Chief of Police, uh, Jim Savine. Uh, it's on our agenda next to talk about uh, is policing strategies as it relate to an employment agreement between the town and and him and his office, and also discuss. Okay, another, another item, but first the agreement and his policing strategies. Uh, Jim, I think we we've seen that page. Uh, Brian shared it with us. You want to give us a, a quick overview or tell us what, what's different from last year's on that? Um, well, the... Can you put that up, Brian? Yep. I've got a couple of things that are just highlighted under the performance goals and strategies, goal one, um, strategy two. So I've been posting the logs on our website, which we had, I had discussed with Joyce and Brian a while back. Um, we're, I've been doing that monthly and trying to be good about doing it monthly. And then the weekly was trying to get that sent out to the select board. So um, posting our, the logs on a weekly basis to the website, um, I was just wondering if we could change that to monthly instead of doing that. Well, if they're doing it for us weekly, is there any reason not, to, and it's public information. Yeah. Um, and understanding that, I know sometimes we, we don't always get them every single week when you have yeah. a busy week as well. Yeah, 
And it is a it is a slightly different report, so I have to run two different reports, and then I have to upload it to the website. Not that it's a huge issue, and if you want it weekly, I can I can work on trying to be better about that um, for the town's web website. I haven't heard any feedback from anybody in the town that that's mm -hmm. been reviewing it that says they want to see data more mm -hmm. often. I haven't had anybody say anything to me about mm -hmm. the logs. So um, how is that one different than the one you send us? Um, so the more information? There's less less information on the one that that it gets posted monthly, um, so there's a little bit a little bit more information in the one that I send to you guys, just so you have a, a better idea where the uh, the one that gets posted is kind of the press log. That's just the basic date, time, incident, and that's it. So mm -hmm. you you guys get to see you know what what officer responded. You get to see you know what their um, yeah. when they cleared the call, what they put in for a a call type, you know, that kind of thing. So you, you get to see a little bit more of that information. Again, not that it's a huge issue. I could I can run a separate report. I just think it's I see. Again, I don't I don't know that it's beneficial to, yeah. to post it on our be, website know, weekly. You probably wouldn't run a report to get this, but to add a page to that PDF that says how many hours were people out on which day, <laughs> that might be the place to report um, uh, traffic um, uh, monitoring. I yeah, mean, that, that, it could be as simple as adding a page to that big PDF, which is pretty straightforward to do in most Yeah, well, it's not, yeah, that, I mean, adding the page isn't the difficult part. It's tracking the, the data that would be yeah. a little bit more, a little bit right. more challenging. I mean, at the end of the shift, can an officer report? I did, you know, uh, whatever they report to you at the end of a shift, maybe there's just an extra line at the end of that that says, you know, how many hours was you know, traffic monitoring roughly on which roads? And it did, no one's going to check it down to the last 10 minutes, right? Yeah. But that yeah, is, but it's, you know, it's a, it would, be one way to collect the data as, yeah. you know, as you go along. Rather so than the, the thing that they do now, what they do now is put it into the log. So I can request that they, they document it more in their log when they're doing traffic enforcement. Um, the, especially the targeted stuff like that we're going to do up on Chestnut Plain Road. That's going to be a separate kind of separate program, mm -hmm. so we can we can make sure that they document that, so we have that data um, available. But there isn't a separate sheet that they give me that says they did this, this, and this. It's just whatever they put into the log um, as they're going through their their shift, what they put in for calls. So, I, I guess Jim, looking at this, I, I really have difficulty. Figuring out what am I looking at? I, I mean, I know I know I can read what you're saying, but I, I don't. How would I use this? What What are you expecting to, to hear from us that that you're looking? At, you're doing traffic. What you're doing is, is you expect us to, I guess, comment on the activities you're you're doing or the the number of activities or I, I, I don't know what to make of this. To make it it's a lot of it's a lot of a lot of detail, uh, and, and a lot as of as far as the logs go, you, you do it for the every day every day of the week, and I can see stuff that's uh, your operation. You know, some is, is repetitive, and and that's what you decided that you wanted your department people to do, and and I guess I I feel like I'm not going to micromanage you to tell you, hey, you shouldn't go every day at this location to look uh, mm -hmm. to a security check. That, that's that's your decision, but mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know, it, it, it's maybe condensing it or, or something. I don't know, it's, it's a lot that I, I don't know what to do with it. I, that's just what was requested of me to, to provide to you guys. Yeah, as well, a reminder, we asked him to do this back when we were having uh, problems like, what, there were how many drug arrests at the castaways or? When when the whole yeah you know, the when when the problems were coming up at the gasways, and we didn't have the log information, we didn't have any way of knowing how much police activity, um, and well and bad activity, frankly, was going on there under the previous owners. But but so that that's information why we asked Jim if he would do this, so that we would be better. Just it's a matter of us being better informed, and this particular report is one that he can relatively easily run for us um, and it there's when I read them I have a million questions but I don't generally uh, end up getting to Jim to ask him about all of them 
but it does give you some idea of what our police are doing. So when, I mean, I wanted to be informed. So if you don't want to get the logs, you don't have to get them. Well, I, I guess being, being informed is, is, is good to know, but it's not complete. Some of the stuff you mentioned, the incidents that occur, I, I know I can see them happening up and down my street and I don't see them recorded in a log. And the log that Jim shares with us, he's got a separate log and he'll tell you that, that he reports probably everything that's, that his department does. And, and to get part of this log, the, the I don't know, the uh, social, what do you call it, social acceptable log without offending people, without putting names or types of incidents in there, uh, to me doesn't really give us a, a total picture of what he's doing. Or Wait, what's Frank, happening in town, I, I guess. Maybe that's it. What's uh, happening in town? Oh, I, I agree with you there that it, it's they could, we could be more informative, but this was something that we could implement easily. I, I actually think that it's gotten a lot better. And I, and I enjoy being informed and I can read the log if I want to read the log and I can read the log at my leisure when I'm not, when I'm not so busy that I can, I can really digest it. Um, I'm not aware of what's not listed on those logs. Um, Fred, I, I guess I would ask you to give me an example of, I, I think you just said that you see stuff happening on your street that's not on the log. And so I'm, I'm wondering what type of incident that would be that's not reported in the log that you see personally. Domestic assault. You see it personally? Yes. We can't report those, Fred. That's not public information. Yeah, see, I, can't, I can't put that in a log. He agrees it's, it's happening, but he can't put in a log. That's what I'm saying. I, I'm not agreeing that it's happening. I'm saying with domestics, by state law, we can't put those in a daily log. That's not public. I can't release that information That's to the public. Right. So it's not complete. Well, but, but, but it's, it's just, well, everything yeah. else that I can legally put in there is in there, Fred. Uh, right. I'm not withholding information. A, a good example of, of everything your department does is, is probably in the annual town report where you list every kind of incident or activity that you're, you've responded to. That's, that's actually less than what our log is. Well, okay, but, but that gives you the whole range of activities. Many of them are not in your weekly report. Well, if you don't like the log, Fred, you don't have to read it, right? Well, but it's what we could do without taxing the uh, already very full plate that our police chief has um, it's, it's and they would have things other than things that are not allowed by law it right. has those other incidents in there but is there a way of making it more useful or better or, or i don't know concise or but but what would the but i i guess i would i would be looking for ideas from from you as to what would make it it better i mean he can't cite Domestic violence, which is completely understandable. Right. Um, you know, we there can't, are we can't put HIPAA, the HIPAA right. protected stuff for medical calls. We, we're not going to put reporting parties information. We're not going to put victim information. We're not going to put that stuff in a, in a daily report. And I would, I would just argue also that one of the things that I get frustrated with is when, when, and it's not, this isn't, directed at you, Jim. It's just, it's a frustration that I have when, when our police chief spends so much time administratively that, that, that he can't be out there in the community. I don't want to, Max, I don't want to make that a, a larger burden on him. I, I want him to be out there more and, and not worry about the administrative stuff because that's just me. So I don't want to ask him to do even more administrative work, taking time away from when he should be out there patrolling Chestnut Plain Road. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I agree. Maybe there's a way of doing it easier than what he's been doing. I, I don't know. Fred, so Fred, I'm, I'm more than happy. If you want to come by the station, I'll sit down and I'll show you the log and we can, we can discuss the, the finer points of the log. And if there's something that you want to see in the log, then I can tell you whether or not I can put that in a log. You know, I think that's the easiest way because there, there seems to be things that you think I'm hiding things or I'm not putting things into the log. That's, that's just not happening. I can show, I can show you the log that, that you guys 
that I sent to you, and I'll, I'll show you an example of the full log, and you'll see the information that's, that's not in there. There's some information that, that really you don't need to, I mean, do you care what fire district it is? Do you care what EMS district it is? Do you care what the primary ID is? Do you care? There's like 10 different lines that you're not going to care what that information is. It's going to be too much information. It's going to confuse you. So I tried to give you the simple information, the date, the time, the location, and what the call type was. Yes. And, and, and then if there's more information, I guarantee what's going to happen is I know personally, I won't read it. I don't have time. Exactly. Right. It's too much. It's right. too much. And, and, and so if, if, I, if something happens, and, and I think I, I know I've done this, if, if there's something in the log where I'm just like, hmm, that's curious, I pick up the phone oh. and I call Jim and I said, what is this? And then he says, this is what it was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. Let's let's move on here with performance goals. What else did you want to tell us, Jim? Is uh, different. Um, so let me just get back to it. So we'll just leave. I don't know what you want to do. Leave that as weekly, monthly. It, just going back to my original request to do that on a monthly basis instead of weekly for the public log that I post onto the website. How much time would it save you to do it on a monthly basis instead of a weekly basis? Um, probably by the time I run the report, put it online, I mean, it's only 15, 20 minutes to, to gather all that information. I mean, I've got to obviously review the report or the logs first, but as you can see, I mean, sometimes I fall behind on the weeklies sending them to you guys. And I just don't want it to, I don't want to get jammed up because I didn't post something on the, the website on a weekly basis when it's written in black mm. and white that this is what I'm supposed to do. I just, mm. I'm a little nervous that, that that's going to, that's going to be an issue. So I just trying to give myself a, you know, monthly, again, I, I haven't been getting feedback. I don't know if you guys have been getting feedback, but I haven't getting feedback from the, the community that they want to see more information or they want to see it more often or they want to, oh, I'm, I'm curious to see what's going on weekly or what happened last week. I'm, I haven't gotten any calls in the two years that we've been posting logs. Mm -hmm. So I just don't think it's, to me, it just doesn't seem like doing it weekly is going to really benefit anything. So that's all. So if you guys want to give it more thought or think about it, that, that's one of the things that I raised. Um, as far as the Go ahead, Jonathan. No, I, I, I was just going to say, I, I get that there are some things, and I, and I don't always ask that you, you see something happening. I mean, I can think of an incident, you know, a few months ago on Haydenville Road that was a major incident, and it was the talk of the town. I don't know whether it was in the log or not. I should have looked, and that would be a good litmus test in terms of a traffic incident. Are these being reported, in, in, you know, that kind of thing. But again, I, I don't want... I don't want this to be over. I don't know. Anyway, go ahead. I'm rambling. I apologize. That's all right. Nope. I have, yeah. I have no problem going to monthly. I, I guess if you want to post that monthly, I have no problem. And like I said, I, I've been doing it monthly. <laughs> and I haven't had any any issues with it. That's why I was hoping to be able to change the, the wording of it. That was all. Um, if you wanted me to go back to weekly, I could. I mean, I think bi-weekly is not, monthly is a lot to read in, in one sitting. For yeah. me, I it just, it, I've got a lot to do with other stuff and there's a lot to digest in a month and your eyes start to glaze yeah. over. If it could be every two weeks, every three weeks, you know, or when you hit a certain number of incidents, then yeah. you press the go button. I don't know. I'm well, from, I'm just, so just, to, just to give you a little insight. So for me, monthly works because at the end of the month, I have to do crime reporting. I have to do crash reporting. I have to do citation reporting. I have a whole list of things that I have to do on a monthly basis. And it's just easier to add that to my list of things to do on a monthly basis. That's, that's really all it is. So that's where the time is really I've good. got a list of 10 right. things. I can spend five hours getting everything done, and then I don't have to worry about it for the rest of the month. Okay. That's, that's the way I look at it. How about, how about this? That's fine. How about if you happen to notice anecdotally that a lot of something's taken place recently where it might make sense to have a mini report about X, Y, or Z mid month and use that and use your discretion at that. Does that make sense? For like for public notification? 
No, if if or for you, know, you, for you guys, for us, because I'm set, I'm still sending them weekly. I, and again, I there's been times where I I've missed a week and send them two weeks or yeah. I've gone out to three weeks. I apologize for that, yeah. but yeah. I, I'm trying to send them to you guys weekly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you, so you have that information. Um, I mean, obviously, if it's something major, you know, I can I can reach out if if we had like the huge rash of B and E's or a murder or something something like that, yeah. which I've done. You know, the the last incident that we had on right. River Road, I sent sent something out right away so you guys knew what was going on because you're going to get probably get calls about it. So. Yeah. Okay. I, I guess I, I you know I understanding that it, it helps kind of unify your workflow to make it monthly i guess i would not object to monthly either and i'm thinking back to when you know we were talking with people in uh one month and there were like incidents that were four five and six months ago that i feel like we should have known about then monthly actually is not too bad um that you know and if it's something more important then i'd want to know sooner yep, but i guess if, if this will help kind of streamline what you have to do then and make your time kind of better used then i i think that's probably a good reason to go from weekly to monthly okay i appreciate it okay let's uh move on jim and the only the only other two things that i had highlighted were under the goals well one i wanted to just have a conversation about it but two um, under goal number two, we've got strategy one and two. So those are the new community outreach events for residents, students, local businesses, new trainings, classes, workshops. Um, those are two different things that you want. You guys were looking to have one done per quarter. Um, so I guess I'd, just discussion wise, I've had a little bit of a struggle because um, some of the things that I've, that I've done thinking of community wide programs, um, things that I could, that I could do that we could plan ahead and set something up. <clears throat> um, I haven't gotten a huge response like ride alongs and, and citizen police academies and different things that, that we've tried to do as a bringing the, the community together and maybe come to the station and have a class where you get together every, every week or every other week or something like that on a night. Um, so those things, I haven't been getting a lot of feedback from the town. I haven't gotten a lot of interest from the town where they, they feel that they want to do all these different programs. Um, so, so the training things that, that I do, um, classes with the senior center, we do coffee with a cop and we get to have a Q and a session. Those things to me are the kind of the, the nuts and bolts of the community policing. So to, to sit down and come up with, four specific incidents and I know why why you guys wanted to do it so you'd have something to gauge you have something on paper we can look at what it's going to be and we can look at you know the results of that I understand that but it's I think for for our community it's it's difficult to plan eight different events throughout the year to do with the community separate from the stuff that I'm already doing to try to come up with all these new things because we just we don't have the types of um things in our community that they have in, in other communities where they're doing way more community outreach we don't have downtown areas we don't have a business district where there's problems with the business district i mean i can stop in and talk to the three or four business people they they flag me down if they've got an issue i i don't need to have a meeting with them once a quarter i don't need to you know, we don't we don't do those types of things it's just just not our it's just not our community um, I'm in the town all the time I talk to people I talk to businesses we do all the business checks I'm at the school all the time if anything's coming up it's already being dealt with at the time I don't I can't I'm having a hard time thinking of a lot of things that we can do that that aren't already being done on a on a regular basis just not as formally so I guess that's where my, my struggle is, coming up with a, an itemized plan, a sheet, a list, here's the things I wanna do, here's the program. Those things that I have come up with in the past, they just, they haven't panned out because there hasn't been the interest from the, the public to do it. Um, maybe there's some suggestions that you guys might have of things that, things that I could do. I'm, I'm just having a little bit of a, 
a struggle with with that. I have Jim. I have a suggestion, um, and I want to be cognizant of the time because this this meeting is going pretty long. But yep. um, one example is, and I like the stuff that you're doing now, and I think we should keep doing it regardless of whether people are taking advantage of it or not, because and that's we're offering, and if people don't accept it, fine. But one of the things that I think would have been interesting to do, and I still think it is, is, you know, with all the current, and you and I talked about it a little bit, or I had a question with you about what's allowed and what's not allowed in Waitley, mm -hmm. in terms of police action. Yep. Taking advantage of the, you know, the, the, the clearly the national um, optics around what, was going on with 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 police forces, yep. Um, as as a result of, of of shootings and 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 all that, uh, and and riots and demonstrations, I think it would have been interesting to host a Zoom for people to say what's allowed and what's not allowed in Whitley. Are we ahead of the curve? Are we behind the curve? What what do you do in Whitley? And again, I get the scale is different from major cities. What do you do in Whitley to make sure that we don't have someone's knee on someone's throat and that kind of thing? Because I, I think it, I think people would have been pleasantly surprised at the, at the limitations we already impose. And it would have at the very least given them an opportunity to ask the questions and, and, and feel like they were putting your feet, holding your feet to the fire. I think those kinds of things, taking advantage of timely public relations events are, are, are going to maximize your exposure and our communication with, with residents. I, I totally agree. And I, I've had a number of conversations, a number of visits from, from community members. And it's actually one of the things, if you guys were looking for something tonight, that was gonna be the first thing on my list. I, I've got it written down to, to do some sort of, um, online meeting type of thing. Um, I've talked about doing it in the past here at the station, having a monthly community open question and answer session where you can come in and ask anything you want. I thought about doing a, you know, adding to my Monday list, doing a, you know, not a podcast, but like a, a video type blog put out there. If people want to ask questions, I can come on and answer the questions. We could have a, a live discussion. You know, I've, I've thought about those kind of things being that we're restricted with our contact with the community. Those are some of the things that, that I've been thinking, and I, I agree. I mean, I, some of these topics are difficult for me to, to just put something out because everybody takes everything the wrong way these days. So, so it's yeah, very but, but again, I think discussion is important. Take advantage of public outrage. I, I guarantee you would have had 25 people at, the, at a minimum in a Zoom meeting about what Waitley uh, policies are around um, police actions during whatever incident. Oh, I have no doubt that that's about how many people I've talked to about it so far and, and, and showed our showed our use of force policy too. Right. Take advantage of the public outrage and hold it. I would still do it personally. I would, I would schedule it tomorrow. Personally. Okay. It's still out there. More than 24 hours notice. Well, <laughs> no, I mean, yeah. I mean, schedule, schedule it tomorrow for a future yeah. date. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess the the the, the other, I, I think thinking of new things to do is is a good idea. I mean, what I was hearing you say is I've got all these built-in ways that I'm out there in the community, and I think that's that's certainly true for those poor sections of the community. You said that like the the businesses and so on, but I think um, the idea of you know, new outreach ideas are is good and you can do things that are timely. I really thought the one about um, uh, identity theft um, and not getting caught up in scams. I thought that was a really, that's one that can be rerun. Yep. And I'd still count it as one of your four um, uh, per year. I mean, at the time yeah. that this was written, I think it was, this was all new. Yeah. And I was reading it as four new things. Right. So it's like, like that would mean like every year you get four more things, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I would, um, I, I guess, I don't know how to change the wording for that. And I wish we'd talked about this two weeks ago, um, but maybe it just needs to be four community outreach 
events that are not just in the line of your typical work day, you know, because we, we do have a community policing focus in your everyday work and I want to recognize that. Um, but I think John's suggestion is a great timely topic and that's one that can be revisited as well because um, uh, maybe you're going to be getting police cameras. I don't know if those have arrived yet. Maybe um, that, you know, yay. <laughs> there it is. We've been uh, using them for two weeks now. Oh, okay. And, yeah. and then, you know, maybe that would be something to hear back about yeah, absolutely. Uh, that people might be interested in. So um, the, sec the second thing on my list was police reform, because that's the hot topic that's got to be settled by the end of Ju July. We're going to see where we're at with things. And that was going to be a, a, the second topic of discussion if we did some sort of meeting like that to give people an opportunity to, you know, and honestly, to affect I, lately. I think if it's a Zoom meeting, it's so much easier for me to go to a Zoom meeting mm -hmm. than to I actually agree. drive to the station at what I, I, there's, my schedule opens up so much if it's a Zoom meeting. Yeah. Um, so you might actually be surprised and get more, um, more people. Yeah. Uh, especially if uh, if it gets kind of advertised, uh, maybe even with the Connect CTY call. Um, yeah. You know. <coughs> yeah, I absolutely think it's a good idea. Yeah. So you know, I, I guess I'm. I'm well, that's that's two. <laughs> that's two. two that I've got. We can we can plan those out because I still want to do the the police reform thing because I'm getting a lot of questions on that oh, yeah. from from people. How's how's this going to affect Waitley? How's this going to affect our police department? If if it changes to, if it changes the the post program that they're talking about, then you know we we may be in a situation where we're going to be losing part time officers and we're going to have to hire more full time officers if we want the same coverage that we have. So it's a bigger, it's a bigger discussion for sure. So. <coughs> Jim, Jim, one thing I've, I've been getting some comments on, and I don't know if you address this or how you handle it. Some people are telling me that when they go to get something from your department or to talk to you and you're not there. And I realize, and I tell him, well, he's not there. He's doing traffic monitoring or he's in court or, or doing something. Yeah. Is, is there something when, when people come to your, to into your office to either log in or, or, or leave a message or, or do something that, that you can get back to them to, to know they were there and you can get back to them because it's not a matter of, of going home and putting on Facebook. Some of these people don't have that. Or, yep. or they're driving by and they say, well, I want to talk to police. Or I saw this incident. <laughs> I want to mention it to police. Yeah. How are you How are you dealing with that? So I have I have all of our numbers posted on the door for dispatch, our station number. Um, we, we haven't been doing the normal office hours because of the town restrictions on uh, public buildings. All so right. we haven't been allowing people inside the police station. Um, but... We, we do have, I put notices out on Facebook, but I put the same notice um, on our front door, but the building being closed, that includes the numbers of, of every, every way to, to get a hold of us, aside from my personal cell phone, which I don't give out to too many people. So, so they, they can't open the outside door and, and go into there. So there's no way for them to leave a message or anything other than call you, I guess. Correct. Or they could, they could, stick a note in the door if they wanted to, but calling us is the best way. And I, I always tell people that call our dispatch center because you can get, you can get us, they can call us on the radio and I can meet you back at the station. You don't have to leave a message. I can just meet you there. Okay. So that's the, that's the best way to, to get a hold of us. We, we have people constantly firearms permits, dropping off drugs, making appointments to, for us to, to meet them here to, to do whatever business we need to do. We're still conducting business. It's just yeah. kind of a modified, modified way of doing it. But yeah, all the, all the contact information is posted. Okay. Email Just, addresses, yeah. telephone Just, numbers, everything. Look, the, the drug drop off thing. So that's not allowed anymore. It is. Yep. Just by appointment only. Oh, so okay. you, you, if you have stuff, you call us and we'll, we'll meet you here and we'll take it from you and we'll dispose of it for you. Okay. Yep. And in firearms permits, we've been doing by mail. People mail in their applications. Um, we process the applications and then we contact them if we need to. That's all been, that's all posted on the door as well. Okay. So what are we doing here with these performance goals? Are we, 
agree with these or change them or what? I think I agree with them overall. The, the one thing that um, I know we're, we're not necessarily good at, and as the police liaison it really falls on me to some extent, um, is we haven't really I had Jim come by once a quarter to say what's the activity, what's the thing you did, and how, or what's the thing that's about to happen, and so on. And I, when, um, you know, roughly three years ago when I got back on the board, I remember that being something that happened that in one of the, uh, one of the early meetings. Um, we, I know we are, we have Jim in often enough, um, but I, I guess to kind of uh, get some get us in the loop of feedback and then you know get it on FCAT so more people even know about it. Um, I, I, I guess I don't see it as part of this performance goals and strategies, but I'm wondering if there can be something um, like just a quarterly report to the selectmen, which doesn't have to even be written. It can be uh, just showing up at a meeting and saying how the, uh, um, you know, the police procedures meeting went. Um, the one where we talk about how, why we're not gonna have somebody suing us over having a police officer with their knee on the back of somebody's neck. Well, they will be suing soon. <laughs> Everybody's gonna be suing for everything. <laughs> right, but we won't have that particular thing. Yeah, being yeah no, I hear you, yeah. Um, so, and and I, I think, um, yeah, I, I, I guess, Reporting to us is the thing that I don't see in here that I thought was in here last time. And but I, I must be wrong. I must have been thinking of some something else. Uh, well, I think it talked about approved in advance by the Whitley Select Board. Yeah, so that would include. I think that was that language. And I, and I think what happened last year is we saw Jim every meeting, Castaway's meeting for <laughs> eight months. three months in a row, and then I think I think we. <laughs> Got tired of seeing them and yeah, it must be well. <laughs> so I, I'd like to propose that we approve this as is, um, but we provide Jim, maybe through Brian, if that's what's appropriate, our suggestions as to what other elements he should be adding uh, and ask for feedback on how he perceives those elements to work or not work. Um, but, but I don't think that it's helpful to, 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 to drag this out and, and, and micromanage it in this meeting right now. I think it's fine the way it is with his awareness that we will individually be reaching out to him with suggestions and, and letting us know if, if he can do those and when, or if there's a reason why he should, why we should not do specific suggestions that any of the three of us might have or including Brian. And the suggestions being primarily the um, um, community outreach events. I'm say that again, Joyce. You're, you're thinking when you're saying our suggestions, you're thinking of um, like uh, goal number two strategy, number one, new community outreach yeah. uh, events or new trainings and stuff like that. Those. Right. Cause that's what we're most, those two strategies. Yeah. 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 No, I, I would appreciate the input. Because like I said, sometimes it's a struggle. You know, being around town all the time, it's like, okay, I, nobody's really coming to me saying, oh, you should do this or we should do that or we should have this big gathering or we should, you know, mm -hmm. it's, so right. I think, I think uh, some additional input would be, would be helpful to, to make sure that we're covering everybody's interests. Just to start that and add to it, could you tell us what you've done so far so we have some idea so we don't repeat stuff that's already you already looked at uh i could come i could come up with a list i mean we like i said we do we do yeah we haven't been doing anything lately because of the coronavirus i mean we've been we've been discussing people we've been doing compliance checks at businesses you know that's regular right. police stuff um but, but none of these like quarterly things have been happening yeah yeah right. but no Prior, prior to that, it's the, it's the um, coffee with a cop stuff that we've been doing yeah, okay. up at the elementary school. I mean, there's, there's different things that aren't like an official planned written out program that this is what we're going to do. It's just th th these are the types of things that we do. Over the winter, I was delivering salt to people's seniors' houses. I took everything out of the back of the mm -hmm. cruiser, and I would make runs delivering salt to people's houses. I mean, those, those types of things are 
it's a, it was a program, but I just look at it as kind of an everyday activity. Somebody needs salt. We've, we've delivered meals. We've delivered food. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. so yeah. those so are officially programs. But, things, but these other things have come up. So that's good to know. Okay. So did I hear Jonathan make a motion to approve this? Yeah. Okay. I'll second it. The roll call vote. Joyce? Aye. Jonathan? Yeah. Fred, yes. Okay. Moving on the agenda. The, the next item we had for the, the for Jim was to discuss and consider adopting a policy for a timely payment of officers working police details. Yes. And so let me, if I could just provide sort of a, a quick summary. Right now, officers are paid. Um, there's really two sections of the law. One says detail officers can be paid after the town receives payment from the vendor, which is which is the which is the current practice of the town. Um, there's also another law that says all town employees have to be paid uh, within a certain amount of time after they work. Um, so the proposal from Jim, which the board discussed this past winter, which seems like forever ago, um, is to change is to change that policy. And I think, if I recall correctly, I think the board was in agreement, but um, we, we had talked about seeding the account and I think we sort of lost a discussion after that, seeding the revolving account. Um, so the, the request now is that is that officer, and it's the same request, that officers would be paid at the next, during the next pay period. Um, if the board is, okay with that i think the next step and i've had started a conversation with our, our town accountant and, and treasurer collector uh lynn and, and dara um we would put together a a i think a pretty brief and short policy that would reflect um those changes because i think we need to document the process um because now we're laying money up front instead of you know paying money that we're getting in um so I guess we're kind of looking for the go ahead to do that. If if it's a if it's not going to happen, we don't want to we don't want to spend our time doing that. Um, so I guess we're looking for for the board's opinion on that. Can it's I not going to impact our, our cash flow or budget, is it? No, no. The only the only the only thing we need to be careful of is that if the revolving account was was negative at the end of a fiscal year. Um, then it would be offset by free cash that and we would that later would be only because of timing, correct? Right. That we would later recoup that. Okay. Yep. okay. I I had two questions. I think maybe I discussed in the last meeting that I thought we would give to the to Jim was one is uh, let me think. Uh, do do out of out of town police officers report to you? For for a temporary uh, for policing like this, if you can't get any any uh, part timers, do you go to surrounding towns? Yes. And so so this would this would mean we would. No. We would pay the surrounding. They they fall under my supervision while they're in our town because they're here on mutual aid. They're so if they're doing something wrong, then I would deal with it. Um, but their town is responsible for doing the billing for the detail. So however their town um, handles it, we, we're not responsible for submitting the, the, the detail bill or paying the officer. It's done through their, um, their appointing town. Okay, and that detail bill goes, goes to the uh, uh, business that, that's, that's needing their, their uh, policing. Correct. They would invoice, say, Eversource directly, yeah. and Eversource would pay the town of Hatfield if it was a Hatfield officer. So when our our part timers are, are patrolling for Eversource, do they personally submit the bill to Eversource, or does that come from the town to Eversource? It comes from me. It goes through you. No, it comes from me. I I fill out the well. We fill out the invoice here at the police station. It gets, we mail it to the vendor. The vendor sends me the check. 
I turn the check over and that's when we pay the officer currently. Okay, so the vendor is never gonna know how soon the officer is paid from the town. No, they that has no bearing on them. They can care yeah, less. Okay. <laughs> is the vendor are are vendors pretty quick about the turnaround, Jim? That's the problem, no. Right. Sometimes it's three months, sometimes it's four months. It we've we've got I've got a list of the, the current outstanding bills. I think the oldest one we have, um, so we've got from, there's four from 2019 that are, that are outstanding. And then there was the two original ones that were in the letter that the business went under. We never, we never got paid. I think it was maybe six, six hundred dollars for six hundred dollars worth of details since I started taking over the details back in 2003, since I took over as chief, um, we've only had um, the two that haven't been paid. Other than that, we, we always end up collecting. It's just a matter of when, and we've, we've tried adding a 10% administrative charge. We've tried adding a $10 late fee. They they'll send it in three, four months, but then they won't pay the late fee. They're, they're not going to pay the late fee. Yeah. So well, can we take them to small flames court? For the ten dollars, for the threat of small flames court. Well, what would you be? I mean, you're trying to recover the ten dollar late fee, and the and 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 charging interest on 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 thirty days post post original no, invoice it's, that kind it's of thing. I mean, the energy of the people who have to do all of that stuff. I I understand that. I'm just trying to, as I as I as I understand this, it it does impact you know th this is cash out for Waitley and eventually we get it back but it's cash out for Waitley out of our out of our out of, out of our general operating budget for an indefinite period of time Can I, ask I, I, I like the policy I just I just get very frustrated with the vendors who who frankly just don't give a damn you, you and me both, along with every other town in Massachusetts. Right. Well, then, then, when John's done, I, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to beat this to to death, but we should think about what we can do. We should post something in a in a letter to the editor every quarter about about those vendors are in there are in arrears. Well, you know, never mind the ten bucks. Yeah. You want some? You want some bad press? Fine, we'll give it to you. I I would rather that didn't come from me. I, I you can because I have to, I have to work with these people out on the road. <laughs> I have no problem with doing it from from me. I think I think in the past, Jim, you've you've refused details, right? If they're if they're not paid up. Uh, not. I mean, we. Oh, you can. We, we've had the we've had the conversation with them. We we haven't really refused a detail. Um, I mean, we have the conversation because mm. like sometimes with the, the railroad or the bridge inspections, sometimes those take, you know, six, seven months. And I told them, listen, if you're not going to pay the bill within 30 days, then we're not going to give you the detail. And sometimes they like, okay, whatever, you know, we'll, we'll pay you in 30 days. So we do the detail and then they don't, they don't pay you in the 30 days. So we're chasing mm. after them for, for the next few months. Right. So, so my worry is this. If we have this policy, in whose interest is it to chase after delinquent uh, customers, for lack of a better word? You know, if the officer is paid. Well, I think I think it's in everybody's interest. I mean, the town gets administrative fees. So, for right. example, but, last, but, but last you know, year, squeaky wheel. There's not going to be a squeaky. If the officer's paid, then the officer's not going to be a squeaky wheel. If the officers they're not, not the squeak, they're not the squeaky wheel anyways. I'm the I'm the squeaky wheel, so it's, it it falls on my shoulders to to make sure that these and this is this this is no different. It's not going to change anything that I do now. I mean, I'm still gonna still gonna make the phone calls. I've got four details with post-its attached to it right now. One of them said they were going to send out the details. We didn't get it this week. I'm hoping we get it next week. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm the, constantly having these conversations with them, so it's not something I'm just going to say. Well, yeah. our well, officers are paid, so I don't care. Well, uh, yeah. So it it might be somewhere in between, though, 
right? If you've got an officer that, you know, this is unfair that they need to get paid for this, mm -hmm. then that might give more urgency to tracking down, um, you know, people who are paying late. And so I, I guess I, I think the amount of money, if you look at it over ten, you know, ten years, is not a lot of money on average per year that we don't get, that we would potentially lose because we paid an officer and don't get paid by the vendor. Um, and I guess then, then my other question was the the previous one where a vendor's been paid didn't pay even after however many years, did that officer never got paid then under the current rules? So they Correct. basically worked a uh, work to shift and didn't get paid. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And and can you refuse to provide a detail officer? And if if that happens, what do they do? Go to state police or? Um, well, typically, if it's a state highway, like Mass DOT will usually call um, the state police. It's it's kind of a a little bit of a bone of contention because we have the authority on the roads in our town, even if it's a state highway. Um, but sometimes it's easier for them to just call the Mass DOT. When it comes to a public road and somebody calls the state police, they're going to say, have you called the Waitley Police Department? Um, so we haven't run into an issue where there's state troopers doing details on town roads other than a state highway on town roads without us knowing about it. I'm usually the one that calls the, the state police if we need, if we can't fill it and we haven't found anybody, I'll, I'll call them to see if they can come up with somebody. They also call us for details on 91 and five and 10. If, if they're getting the calls, they'll call us. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a back and forth, but there's, I don't know legally that I can say Verizon, you can't go work on your polls. I know like with Asplund, I've, I've told them we, when they were doing the tree trimming, like, listen, you guys, you need details on these roads and they'll try, they'll say, okay, we'll, we'll go out there and see if we get caught. And then I go and I shut them down until they hire a detail. So we've had those types of situations. So if it's a public safety thing, and if it's something where they're, you know, they're blocking the, the whole lane of traffic, it's a public safety concern, then, then absolutely I can shut them down. Um, if they've got two or three trucks set up and the potential for, for a dangerous situation, then they're not going to be working out on the, on the detail. Um, we haven't had to do that other than, you know, like I said, with, with that one vendor where you shut them down, then the next day they, they hire a detail. Um, a, uh, lot these, a lot of these jobs are... Like what, basically, if we put the new policy into effect, the town takes on the risk of non-payment and um some level of cash flow which apparently the numbers are small enough that we're not worried about the cash flow um but i guess the the other kind of exposure is like do we also are we also taking on in some other way the the work of tracking that down and it sounds like the answer to that last one is no you are committed to doing that work of tracking it down even after the police officers um, have been paid um, yes. because if that revolving fund goes really low then we might have to revisit <laughs> the policy is I guess what maybe we we can do this for some period of time and see how it goes um, it seems like a minimal risk would be taking on unless there's something I hear that I haven't heard very well does that is that what you're hearing Fred yeah. Well, who, who would be managing the revolving account? Would it be Jim, you, you or is it going to be town administration? Well, the, the account's already there. And we already, I already put the money into the, the account when the detail comes in and the money gets paid out of that account. The account's already there. And it's always in the negative because of the way things get posted. So it's always a couple thousand dollars in the negative anyways, because of timing wise just how things get posted from one payroll to the next so i don't think anything accounting wise really would change it's just i think it, the the concern was making sure accounting wise that it was okay to continue to run that account into the the negative and how's that going to affect us at the end of the year i think those are the big concerns i know that that brian had Okay. It's not, a, it's not an account that needs to be set up. It's not, it's already, in, everything's already in place. 
it's just a policy change that we're just going to say, yes, we're now going to start paying the officers before we get the check. That's, that's all it is. Okay. Any further discussion? We need a motion to uh, approve this, uh, account and then we also need to put money into it no, no there's no seed money that was the original yeah. request was to put seed money in there but brian can speak further to that yeah i think we decided a while ago not to do that right you're tying up you're tying up cash if you're going to do that yeah i mean so what i'd like to do is put together a policy um okay. if you guys want to take a vote to to make that change and and have me you know, put we'll put together a policy that lays out. Okay. Well, yeah. Process. Can we? You said just direct you to go ahead and do. Yeah, do the policy. Do we have to take the vote now, or do we do it after the policy? Um. I mean, you would have to vote to adopt the policy. Mm -hmm. So, Which, so we'll it would be at a future meeting. And so, does that mean we? You, you, the, I mean, the sense of the room is that we'd want to pursue this. Right. So why don't I plan to? Why don't we plan to put something together for the next meeting? Okay. Uh, 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 August, uh, whatever. Twelve. Twelve. All right. Okay. All right. We all agree that you proceed with this, putting something okay. together. Okay. Moving on, the agenda. Uh, COVID nineteen state of emergency. Do we need to discuss any of these uh, directives any further, Brian? Um, I don't think so. Um, we have a significant number of, uh, so, so the, the, the short answer is no, but we have a significant number of K, KN95 masks, over 6,000, and we have over 6,000 surgical masks now. Wow. Um, so and about 800 gonna, face shields. <laughs> and 800 face shields, so Jim's going to contact the schools, um, see what they need. Um, but it's, yeah. Everything is pretty quiet in in town, um, unless Jim knows something I don't know, because he has access to better information than me. But so the the only thing that the only the most recent thing that came up as far as the state of emergency, we had two two issues. One with the auction house um, on Tuesdays with people not wearing masks. We we dealt with that issue, and we've also been working with the board of health. I think Brian was involved as well with. Um, Tom's Hot Dog Stand is starting their Friday um, car show. So we're just kind of watching that to make sure that everybody's wearing their masks or social distancing and to make sure they've got it set up properly, which last Friday everything seemed to be to be okay. Um, I know Fran was involved with putting out some recommendations from the, the Board of Health as well. So those are the only kind of COVID-related things other than just the supplies that we're getting in. Just a reminder that, that, that we, and we need to keep reminding people that we are not out of the woods. I mean, there were, there were over 350 new cases in Massachusetts today, which is a higher number than we've seen since June 11th. So, yeah, we're you creeping know, up. Yeah. Use, use the resources that are at our disposal and, and bug people to, to be diligent because it's the only way that we're going to kill this thing. I, I was on a, I was on a, a, we have a, well, now it's kind of bi-weekly call with the four towns and the boards of house. And, um, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn, but the Deerfield said that they have three new active cases that showed up over the weekend. So, mm. I mean, the virus is, has not gone away. Let's put it that way. Um, and it's still in our community. So we need to continue to be careful. Okay. One I guess comment I had the, the, the second one here opening uh, town buildings to the public for limited hours. If we're opening the town hall for elections, do we need to clarify that or exclude events like elections to let people know that it's not open for activities, events? Yeah. I'll take a look at the language, and if that's what we if that's what we decide to go with at the next meeting, then it, it may we may need to amend it. But we'll take I'll take a look at the language. Okay. But can I? We don't have to do that tonight. No. Right. Yeah. Okay. Moving on. 
the old business. Discuss. I'm willing. I'm willing to if we want to move this one to the next meeting. That might. Yes. Okay. Makes sense seeing it's ten of nine. Right. Uh, we need a, a new business. Consider the contract for Chestnut Plain Road. Um. Yep. So, so the project for the what, what we've been talking about the Chestnut Plain Road crosswalks and sidewalks reconstruction project that went out to bid, and I sent you out the list of the. I sent you out the bid tabulations and. Uh, Taylor Davis is a low bidder. Um, base bid at 175, 670, 120. And the ad alternate, the ad alternate is for extending the sidewalks uh, further south from Haydenville Road uh, because we had we have around 200 and I forget exactly what it is 204, 209 thousand dollars from the complete streets. So we wanted to use up all the money that we have. Um, so they're the little bidder, so we'll be looking to award the contract to Taylor Davis. This is the same company that um, was a subcontractor that did the town hall work, uh, the parking lot, the sidewalks there. And they also did some work. Uh, they did the sidewalks on 116 in Sunderland. Um, and we had good experience with them. Okay. okay I is this something we need to vote on? Yep. Make a motion we approve the contract with uh, Taylor Davis to do... Work Second. on Chestnut Plain Road. Second. Okay. We'll call a vote. All those in favor? Joyce? Aye. Jonathan? Yeah. Fred? Yes. Okay. Down to the town administrator updates. All right. I'll make it quick. Center school um, committee presentation. That'll be August 12th. Um, CDBG, this is a regional micro enterprise assistance grant program. The fund, this is the uh, regional program that Greenfield um, took the lead on. So that was awarded. And I'm just waiting to uh, further information uh, for Greenfield. They'll email us the, uh, the packet and the information that we could send out to businesses. And Williamsburg Road Bridge replacement project, that's, there's not really much new there, but it, it's, it's ongoing. Um, and um, in terms of the water conservation restriction, that's related to, um, most related to a couple things, but I mean, the, the ultimate solution is the, is the installation of booster pumps and um, that went out to bid today. So um, it has to be out for two weeks and then we'll be looking uh, to award the contract and then they can get those booster pumps installed, so. Or, hey Brian, have you heard? Is the is the wa are the water levels minus the pumps? Forget that for a second. But the lack of rain, except for the torrential down down uh, downpours that we've been seeing, are the water levels sufficient these days anyway? Um, yes, I think. I mean, it, it's lower, but um, if they got really bad, I think the water commissioners would be looking for. Um, they would need to go back to a. Uh, mandatory water restriction and, and get rid of the odd even. Right. Um, so right now, yeah, they're doing all right. We're doing all right. Okay. All right. Okay. Any other items we need to discuss this evening? Um, and I just, I sent you guys the, the notification that the town's going to receive the uh, $27,800 in the settlement with um, vendors, uh, Pioneer and uh, noble for deceptive practices that was right. in relation to the right. the purchasing issues with the with the fire department so great great news um, good i hope they're out of business All right unfortunately i don't think they are but okay so our next meeting other than well august 5th at 5 for a quick meeting and then august 12th is our next scheduled meeting at 6 6 p.m on the 12th Make a motion to adjourn. Second. Uh, roll call vote. Joyce? Favor. Jonathan? Please. Fred, yes. Okay. Greg, have a great night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Have a good evening.